the British Society for Population Studies has around 350 members. It's mainly academic, uh, but there, there are a good sprinkling of local government and devolved statistical agencies uh, and a few private companies who are also members. Um, our organisation aims at uh, broadening the understanding of demographic issues and sharing that knowledge to the wider public. And we do that through our day meetings, such as today, which are open to everyone, members and non-members alike, free of charge. And we also have an annual conference that this year is in Cardiff, the 9th to 11th of September. And you're very welcome to come to that, also if you're a member or a non-member, although you'll get a discount as a member. Um, I come from a local authority background, and um, the theme for today of life expectancy, of stalling life expectancy, is very marked as a local authority level. If you look at the highest and lowest uh, levels, if you're born in the city of Glasgow, you have a life expectancy which is roughly 10 years less than someone born in Kensington and Chelsea. That figure has been more or less static for the last uh, 15 years. The gap is still around 10 years. But if you look at disability-free life expectancy, the gap is widening. And that is something we should be worried about as well as stalling life expectancy. But the gap between the best and worst local authorities is now up to 20 years. So someone born in Rutland will live to the age of 71 without any disability, whereas someone born in Blino Gwent in South East Wales will get to 51. So it's a striking difference there. And there are policy issues that need to be addressed to try and narrow that gap. Uh, I'm going to do this very quickly in 20 minutes, uh, so there's enough time to ask questions. I've got 12 slides to show you before I get onto the mid-year estimates. Um, this one uh, up here is a, a slightly complicated graph about the population of the British Isles and how it's changed since, well, since 1500. Uh, but the key reason to put it up is to say that things are complicated. Some things I think are simple, some things are complicated. If you look in detail at it, the higher up you go, the higher is the population of the British Isles, till now this is Ireland and the UK together. The big sweep out uh, to the left is the famine in Ireland, which, which is a huge demographic event. And the big sweep out to the right, 2008, is the A8 migration. We invited people to come in 2003, especially when we opened up. Quite a lot of people came. It had uh, some influence on what's going on in Britain at the moment. But it may also matter for trying to understand what's happening to life expectancy now, because this country was very fortunate in getting a large number of young, healthy, fit people coming, disproportionate numbers of whom may have well worked in care homes and so on. Uh, I'm going to mainly talk about what we know has happened. But the really complicated thing is then trying to work out why it has happened. And I suspect we're going to spend the next 10 years trying to do that. But I thought I'd, I'd start with that particular slide. What do we know has happened? And when did we begin to suspect that something is going wrong? It was 2013, the summer of 2013, when analysts in what by then I think had become Public Health England started saying something's going wrong with mortality and producing uh, kind of unofficial reports that got into the press. Uh, in February 2014, I wrote an article for the New Statesman asking why are the old dying before their time? And this is one of the graphs from that about the recipients of uh, social care. Who was getting visits from adult social services. These visits were just 15 minutes that you used to get once a week, somebody would check you're okay. I learnt last week, I live on a road in Oxford, and the news went round the road last week that a man had died seven weeks ago, and our postman had found him the week before. So six weeks lying at home dead, just a few uh, you know, houses away from where I live. That becomes increasingly common. If he had had an adult social worker, who had turned up once a week for 15 minutes, well, A, he might not have died, but at least the body would have been found. So that those are the kind of issues we're interested in. Here's the very first 2% drop in life expectancy. The first recorded falls in Britain 
were for elderly women. And again, I'm going to give you the guessing. The guessing is that elderly women were much more likely than elderly men to be living on their own and more likely to be dependent on the state or meals and wheels or so on. They're the kind of canary in the mine. So you expect elderly women's mortality in a time of crisis to increase first and then elderly men and then it spreads. And I'll get on to the mid-year estimates and show you how far it appears to have spread uh, so far. And there's been a running battle about the extent to which influenza has been responsible for this. At the time, we were saying that the most that influenza and pneumonia, often deaths from <laughs> influenza are recorded as pneumonia, could have contributed was 5.8% and 3.5% of the deaths, unless there was mass misdiagnosis on death certificates. Um, Whatever it is will be multi-causal. When something as bad as what's just happened happens and continues to happen, it is quite likely that almost everything had to have gone wrong. Um, so the going wrong in includes the threat of closure of 752 care homes. didn't happen. But if you have hedge funds who own the landlords, who are renting out to their care homes, who aren't getting the return, who threaten their care homes with bankruptcy and so on, that's just one of the many, many factors that was going on in this period, 2012, 13, 14, that we're looking at. The graph there is target 1A of the National Health Service, uh, which is preventable deaths. And you can see the health service is going down and down. They are helping prevent preventable deaths. Uh, they classify a series of causes of death as preventable. And then it begins to flatline, and it began to flatline late 2.11 to 2.12. Right? The NHS has its own indicators, its own monitoring. The one interesting thing we've discovered in the last few years is that although lots of organisations are responsible, including having a statutory responsibility to monitor things, nobody appears responsible to have to do anything about it. Um, and we, you know, we wouldn't have known that without these events. And there's chance, there's coincidence. It just so happened that the very worst figures of all in any one year the 2015 mid-year estimates, which revealed that 52,000 more people had died than we thought had died, were scheduled to be released and released exactly on schedule on exactly the day that the referendum result was released. Now, utterly understandably, the news media of Britain was transfixed with the fact that 52% of people had voted to leave. And that's the kind of news that you have to have not to have the news that the biggest rise in mortality since the Second World War has occurred uh, and the two may be related I won't go through the figures because this is old news to those of you who know, who know this but 2012, 13, 15 ramping up and up 14 is a little dip we're beginning to get little dip periods you know kind of mortality rises up and up and then the best guess that I have is that um, enough of the frail have died because the health service and social care service have, has a capacity but when it goes over that capacity, enough of the frail die because they can't be cared for, that you get a sort of 12 months of grace uh, when the death rates go down for a little bit and then, then they're up again. You have to remember in this period, this is the first time ever we cancelled almost all routine operations in NHS hospitals for at least a month. And mortality even rose then, despite the fact that we'd actually emptied the beds ready for one particular winter. Other fortunate things in terms of trying to explain this our last cold winter was 2010. Thanks to the amount of carbon we've put in the atmosphere, well, we may argue about this later, but honestly, I think we agree it's carbon. Thanks to the amount of carbon we put in the atmosphere, we have had the longest string of warm winters ever on this period. So it is not cold winters. Um, this is what a flu epidemic normally looks like. Short, sharp, five weeks, these are the ones that have occurred in the past in England. They're not long, steady things that continuously kill lots of people. One reason for putting this slide up is that there, my friend Tom Harrison has told us, there is currently very bad flu in Australia. Um, and the real worry, the real worry is because we've been saying flu continuously, it's gone quiet recently, but saying flu since 2012-13, the worry is what happens when the flu really comes? Um, and that's and what happens when, if the flu comes at a time where we've become used to rising mortality so we're not, we're not shocked by it? 
So a new strain of flu may be coming this winter. And the whole point is, now is the time to start talking about it. There is enough time between now and the winter to get ready properly for uh, what could be our first serious epidemic of flu for years. Um, these are very crude figures, but worked out for the mid-year estimates. And going all the way back as well, using all the estimates since 1832 that we've had in this country of the years of worst <coughs> rises in mortality, the worst year was 1918-19, a flu pandemic, and of course the war, but the flu pandemic was worse. The second worst year for a rise in mortality was 1940. The third was the very cold winter of 1929. The fourth was the Great Frost of 1895. And then the cholera, when Jon Snow was, you know, supposedly taking the handle off the pump, which he took off a bit late, uh, 1846, 1849, and then 2015. I'm just trying to get you an idea about how much this matters. And by the way, the punchline is, and it's got worse since then. Right? The interesting question is, we've kind of got used to it. Or, I'll get on to that at the conclusion of the question. The question is, well, how bad would it have to get before we got bothered? Um, you know, hey, this is only, you know, number seven out of bad years since 1832. Maybe that just isn't good enough. Uh, and what I worry about is to what extent English society has changed from a society that would have cared and be scared about this in the past to one which accepts it in the way that this kind of thing is now accepted in the United States. Uh, you can go back to Margaret Thatcher. I think in 1985, Margaret Thatcher signed up to WHO Target 1, which was to halve inequalities in mortality by the year 2000. Now, they actually doubled. But the good thing was that she thought that they would halve. She thought what she was doing, trickle-down of money, would make the world, the country better, and they would halve. New Labour had a series of four targets. They hit the two easy ones, which were the diseases which were coming down anyway, and they didn't do that badly on the other two. As far as I'm aware, this government has no targets. It may do. Um, but the interesting question is, why, why could Margaret Thatcher have targets for improving health and our current government not? Um, early warning signs. David Cameron, shortly after becoming Prime Minister, announced that there'd be a new happiness measure. Um, we'd monitor how much we're going to make the country happier. And... So the major components of this, and ONS were tasked with producing it, the key components were questions about your health, annually asked. Nobody actually looked at the happiness measure after, after it was declared. It's, I've seen no news reporting of it. I assume ONS still produce it. Um, but these were the data, they were derived from the British Household Panel Study by ONS about people telling us that they were getting iller. So it's a bit like Spike Milligan, you know, on his gravestone, it says, I told you I was ill. Um, when I first presented this, very good friends, very, very good epidemiologists told me that never happens. That has to be artefact. It will be artefact. It will be a change in question wording. You never get a change that fast. But it's ironic in hindsight that we asked the population how their health was, and they told us it was getting better, and they <laughs> haven't told us. It could be complete coincidence that we asked people about their health and they told us it was getting worse and then they started dying in high numbers. Um, we are in a period where it, the onus is on people like me to apparently prove that illness might be related to death. You know? <laughs> um, whereas I honestly think if people want to try to claim that austerity can happen and you can not have any effect from cutting health visitors, the onus should be on them to show that. I think it's reasonable. But I'm told, no, no, you must show it. Austerity. IMF figures, proportion of GDP spent on public services as a whole from 2002 through to, because countries tell the IMF what they're going to do, through to 220. Um, you can see there, if you follow the thick black line, that's the UK. The, you can see the rise of labour spending money, not fixing the roof when the sun's shining, 2002, 2003, 2004, you see it rising slightly. Uh, sadly, for those of you who like labour, that was the extra spending on the Iraq war. Um, it wasn't. Anyway, uh, the shooting up in the middle is the bailout of the banks. 
Ireland goes completely out of control because they asked our advice and we told them to guarantee every last bank account. Um, anyway, I won't talk anymore about Ireland. You can see countries like Finland and France spending over half their GDP on public services and schools and so on. And you can see us uh, zooming down to 36% of GDP. The political debate in Britain, the Labour manifesto promises 38%. We're currently on target for 36 We play a game within there. But anyway, that's, that's a measure of austerity. We've had much deeper, more vicious austerity than anywhere else in Europe, far deeper than Spain and Greece, by any way in which you measure it. Um, people in Spain and Greece are very good at talking about austerity and saying it's terrible and having strikes and refusing to have people evicted from their homes and so on. We're very stiff upper lip. Um, we kind of take it. Um, and that, that might be a national character thing. The flatlining, this is old data. This is data that stops in 2015. It was flatlining in 2015. Life expectancy is now falling. If we had a population the size of Fiji, it would be debatable. But we don't have a population the size of Fiji. The error bounds on life expectancy estimates are so tight um, that there is no... There's a lovely paper um, written in the last couple of years about which Pacific islands can we not work out life expectancy for with reliability. Um, but of anywhere on the planet, apart from Sweden, who are better than us, we really do have a fairly good idea of the population who are in this country at risk. And we have a good idea of who's died in this country. And we had a brilliant policeman who was on the search for Lord Lucan, who actually, because he was trying to work out whether Lord Lucan was dead in this country, has, has gone into detail about who is buried under motorway viaducts. So honestly, you know, our death statistics are remarkably good. You know, life expectancy is, as I'll show you in a minute, falling. Uh, but it doesn't matter whether it's falling. It's just as bad that it's flat as if it's going down from a few weeks or months. It shouldn't be flat. We have one of the lowest life expectancies in Western Europe. There are countries like Finland where there's been no slowdown at all. And if I just go back a section, you know, what does Finland do when austerity hits, when the banks go bust? And for the poor people in Finland, where Nokia looks like it's going to go bust because of a company called Apple, right? You might think it's game over for Finland. What Finland does is actually increase taxation so that no public service is damaged. Uh, and Finland, there's no, not a jot of jolt in the improvement in life expectancy. Babies are twice as likely to survive their first year of life in Finland as opposed to us. And it's not just Finland, it's just the majority of of Europe. So flatlining by 2015, uh, dropping in England for women by 2015, if, if you look. Um, I won't talk about the other countries of the UK. Somebody really needs to look into depth in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has had the worst child health for, for decades. Um, the Scots are now producing reports saying as far as Scotland is concerned, they think austerity is the most likely cause. They're doing it very carefully, a bit slow for my liking, but Scotland will tell the story. Uh, Wales is likely to get ignored, but it's worth. And then the Welsh NHS gets blamed, which is just silly. Um, ONS produced this brilliant graphic, was it last year? Neonatal mortality ranking uh, from how the ranking of the UK switched from 1990, when we were the seventh best country in Europe, to 2015 when we were down at 19th, the biggest fall. That's 2015. Since 2015, of course, we've had absolute increases in mortality. Again and again and again and again. Each one significant. And I have spent days looking at the number of babies who've died at 23, 24, 22 weeks gestation as part of 25, 26. This is not because of more premature babies. But the instant thing we do in Britain when more babies die is we go, oh, must be some artifact. Um, infant mortality is rising. It doesn't affect the life expectancy figures at all because you're talking 80 to 100 babies. But it shouldn't be rising. We shouldn't be down at 19th. And we shouldn't, although I'm very, very glad Romania is coming up so fast. But there really isn't an excuse that we are on target for our infant mortality rates to be worse in future than Romania if the current trends continue. I mean, 
No, I don't want to say because Romania does need infant mortality to go down. When I was born, the place you always talked about was Portugal. Babies were three times more likely to die in Portugal than in Britain. Portugal was the kind of horror story of Europe. Now it's places like Romania, but it will be us in, in future if it carries on as things are going. And those are the data for the projections from the Institute of Actuaries about how the projected life expectancy of people over 65 have fallen. And now we're on to the new data. OK, that's all, that's all known. This wasn't known until last week. Um, 26th of June, 2019, we get the annual mid-year estimates. And we know something new. And ONS will produce a series of reports this year, but all the reports they produce, I think, will be based on data that, in effect, has been released last week in the mid-year estimates. And we won't know anything else new until this time next year. Uh, 623,000 deaths, 20,000 more deaths than the previous year. You might say, oh, that could be due to ageing. The great thing about the mid-year estimates is they tell us whether it's due to ageing. They tell us whether it's due to a whole load of, you know, retired people in Spain sneaking in in boats or not. But it's just not impossible, which we have worried about. Um, the BBC calling Population Matters it used to be the Ottoman Population Trust to comment on whether we still have too many people. You know, if any country in Europe was trying to get rid of people by either being really inhospitable and rude so they don't come or allowing them to die in greater numbers, it's us. And still the BBC's lead commentator is somebody from the Ottoman Population Trust, about too many. And that's that, you know, if you're trying to work out how the hell can this be happening in Britain, it might be because we're this kind of a country now. That's the conclusion I'm coming, trying, slowly coming to. The Guardian leads on 275,000 net immigrants, and it's a little bit higher, 6,000 higher, possibly. The Express, of course, happily goes with yet another city the size of Coventry has arrived. So I decided to look at the detailed statistics for the city of Coventry because the mid-year estimates tell you everybody who's died in Coventry by individual year of age, by sex, by how many have migrated in and where they've come from. So we know, I've got it down to, I don't know if it's there. No, I haven't got it there. I think two men over 90 came in from overseas into Coventry, right? or the estimate at least is from the National Health Service records. Now, Coventry is too small an area to get the life expectancy data. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what we now know. And here's the summary. So I must leave that up for 30 seconds. This is a summary for men. The first column is the number of deaths that occurred the year before. It goes from mid-year to mid-year. So it's the number of deaths that occurred in all of England by age between June 2016 and June 2017. The second column is the number of deaths in the most recent year that has been reported. The third column is by how much it's increased. Now, the children 0 to 4, male boys, has actually gone down by 88. This is the third column. You go right down to the bottom, and you find 9,493 9, more dead than the year before. But that doesn't tell you anything, because that could simply be ageing or in-migration. But then when you get to the fourth column, you have the increase in the rate having allowed for the changing uh, underlying population at risk. And it's almost all red because for almost every single age group, mortality is rising. And last, and I think most useful, is the rise in deaths per million people, uh, which is for men an extra 287 deaths per million, but obviously stacked up at the older ages in particular. Now, we get fascinated by things like, you know, why are people in their early 70s not dying? And it'll be interesting to kind of find out. And I won't begin to speculate. I think it has more to do with migration to or from the continent than anything else. It's not about golden cohorts. We don't have any golden cohorts kind of left, I think, from this. But the whole point is it's all red. And it's spread from the old... Um, down in the, in the latest figures for men. So it's very bad news. The equivalent for women doesn't look quite so bad, um, except for over 90s. An extra 6,358 per million women, as compared to the year before, which was an awful year 
already life expectancy was falling, it's fallen even more. When you get all of that, life expectancy falls. ONS, I'll leave ONS, I always leave ONS to do it, I do not irresponsibly calculate my own life expectancy figures. I could, I'd use the Chung Tzu method or whatever, the other one they do, but you know, you don't want people producing two different life expectancy numbers, so I don't do that. And I'll show you what ONS produce in a minute. Here are those rates drawn on a graph for increasing mortality having taken into account the population at risk. And the other great thing the major estimates do is they give us the very latest population estimates so that we know that there hasn't been a sudden influx of people, you know, at least that we can count. We also do things like monitor the sewage in Britain to work out how many people are here who are not counted, by the way. Right? This country is obsessed by counting people. Um, so mortality has gone up again. And here's the figures for Wales. Um, so we published this in the, in the conversation. Uh, I didn't include the figures for Wales, but, but there they are, just to let you know it's Wales as well. I've left Northern Ireland and Scotland to somebody else to do. Uh, Steve is here from ONS. He might get annoyed, but this, this, I think this has to be checked more. So in the ONS press release, it had words such as, there were also fewer live births in England than Wales in 2017, and uh, it wasn't in italics, but it's a, and this meant the infant mortality rate increased from 3.9 to 3.9. The infant mortality rate doesn't increase when there are fewer births. In fact, normally it goes down because it means people have been able to be more selective over whether they want to become a parent. So as, infant as births go down around the world, infant mortality goes down even more because mothers in precarious situations are not giving birth. Anyway, just it, it, has, it has to tighten up a bit. Right? You can't have infant mortality rising four years in a row and a misleading statement from ONS. And you also can't have any more BBC more or less. I keep quoting, if anyone wants to do Twitter, just say hashtag BBC more or less, Danny Dawling said yet again, you've got to get your act together. <laughs> because more or less did a programme about rising infant mortality where they wanted to claim it as an artefact, and it's risen again since they did that. So it's time they did it again properly this time. Um, ONS life expectancy figures, just showing you the differences. This is the most detailed data that ONS has, has released. These are all the countries for which ONS had data up to 2016, without exception. The reference is at the very bottom. They don't make it easy to find. I actually set the best of our third year students at Oxford. Um, simple, the question is, find this data. And if you manage it, I'll give you a first class mark. Um, so anyway, I don't want to have a go. ONS are brilliant. If it didn't do all this, we'd be stuck. Um, but it could be made easier. Uh, what you're seeing here are the changes in life expectancy. That the, the cells coloured green are the years of the biggest kind of increase. Our last big increase was 2008 to 2010. After the financial crash, before the coalition came in. Uh, and then this is for women, two years of falls. It's as a proportion of a year. So you can work out what 15% of a year is. Right? And these should have been going up. Now you can see Spain and Australia, they had falls from 2013 to 2015, but then they were more than reversed the next year. Not in the UK. We stand out. There's a whole table of 20 countries there uh, in the ONS one, but they don't have 2016 data, so I'm showing you that. But essentially we are the only place now which is having continuous falls in life expectancy of the richest countries. So that's for women. Uh, this is for men. comes a little bit later. 2014 to 16 is the first overall fall in life expectancy. 0 0.07 of a year could work out the confidence limits. I absolutely tell you, they won't include zero. That's a real fall. Um, and yes, smaller falls happened in Australia and Spain a year before, but they were corrected. And life expectancy shot up by far more the next year. 0 0.18, 0 0.19 for Spain. And I haven't even gone down and looked at what happens in Norway, what happens in Switzerland, right? If it was flu, it's a really special kind of red, white, and blue flu, right? That's all, yeah? 
oh, that's flu everywhere, but the other countries have got their kind of system set up that they can deal with people with flu and they don't have to die in the numbers. Last slide. So I'm going to add to, add to Gemma. I've got two last slides. Over. And this is where I'm going to now. You know, I'll carry on doing this. I've been doing it for years. I'll carry on producing, but I won't bother saying it's terrible anymore because um, there's a limit to how long you can carry on saying it's terrible. What I'm beginning to become interested in is how you come to accept things, how, we, how you come to accept it if it's slow and steady and gradual. Uh, these are the gates of Trinity College, Cambridge. Trinity College, Cambridge, for those of you who don't know, is the one college thinking of leaving the university pension scheme. And it also happens to be the richest college of any college in the UK. They have an absolute fortune, um, and the fortune's growing. If you look very carefully, you'll see one of the tents outside the gates of Trinity College, Cambridge, of the people who now live homeless outside the gates of Trinity. And just to match it, we have our own Trinity College, Oxford. Apparently, this gate is not to be opened until the prince returns from across the water, Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, and there's an enormous lawn there. Our Trinity College, Oxford's not doing bad. And if you look very carefully, you'll see the tents of the homeless people outside the gates of Trinity College, Oxford. And you'll know. You'll know there are people sleeping everywhere now. And there weren't 10 years ago. And I think it's all part of this. We've become used to something. And then the worry is... Because we've become used to it, we're not going to do very much about it for some time to come. I think that's what's most likely. And I'll hand over to Gemma now. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi there, Danny. Um, so for those of you who didn't see, Danny's written a great piece on the conversation about some of this data. Um, and at the end of it, Danny... Ooh. Just hold it. Yeah. At the end of it, Danny, you say, so why do we care so little that we cannot even be bothered to analyse and interrogate our mortality statistics properly? I just wanted to first ask you, again, whose job is it to do that and to work it out? And, and if anyone then has a question, if you want to put your hands up, we can put these moving mics around for yeah. about 10 minutes. Uh, it, it, doesn't, I'll do that. it doesn't appear to be in anybody's job description. And that may have been a, a hindsight. If, if a government in the past had actually made it the remit of an authority... I would have thought that if you were a chief medical officer, you would actually decide that you should be interested in, in this. But none of the chief medical officers, Dame Sally included a chapter in, in her 10th report, which was written by Tom and Lou and me. Um, so I'd say chief medical officers, secretary of state for health, particularly if you've been in for years and years and years and your, your name was Jeremy Hunt. Um, you know, he must have known what was going on. Or if Jeremy didn't know, who decided not to tell him from amongst his officials? Uh, I say anybody who has the word chief in their job title, chief nurse, chief executive of the NHS, all of those, I think is fair enough to say. But it would be good if we actually made it in future a statutory responsibility of somebody, not just to report the figures, but to say what they mean and whether something should be done about them, which is what we do with schools, with Ofsted. But you could have said that nobody could have anticipate, anticipated this, this happening. Uh, the Health Select Committee, the House of Commons is our best bet at the moment, I think. The Health Select Committee, the House of Commons, could instigate an inquiry into this. Um, but they have to decide that it's important. The biggest rise in mortality since the Second World War might be something of interest to the Health Select Committee, the House of Commons. And the question is, why not? And this, I'm afraid I've come to the conclusion it's rather like unemployment in the 80s, which if you can remember, I can remember the 80s when it got to 3 million. But people still voted in 83 and 87 and 92 in a particular way, and the majority of the population decided it was a price worth paying for a more efficient country. And I've got a horrible feeling that the majority feeling in this country is a few elderly people, a few thousands, tens of thousands, dying a bit earlier, and a few marginal babies dying rather than living, um, is a price worth paying for what we want to get to. And that isn't what we used to think, and it isn't what <coughs> other countries think. And the thing that struck me when I first saw the figures for the rise in mortality in elderly women was this was exactly the same demographic that Harold Shipman picked on. 
and Howard Shipman could get away with it because there was a lack of interest, particularly in elderly women living on their own, not living for longer. And I'm afraid that this is the conclusion I'm, I'm coming to now. I don't think shouting out fire and saying it's getting worse is likely to have that much effect. OK, does anyone have a question in the room? OK. Uh, You've got one there. Yeah. Thank you, there is one person who has a very great interest in all those finance and government statistics, Ed Hutchison of the UK Statistics Department. Mm. And he has certainly never not spoken against politicians, including Jeremy Hunt and Andrew Lansley, who misuse official statistics. Why don't they listen to Ed? I do well. Um, uh, Ed has ordered them, I think it was Public Health England, to take a tweet down, and they said they would. Uh, the tweet's still up. It's probably cock-up. Uh, but I presume Ed has no teeth. There is no fine. I don't know. Uh, he has done this. He has, you know, I, I complained to him at one point. The complaint was fully investigated. He decided that when they said, I forgot what it was, Department of Health and Public Health England, something like health has never been better than before. We are doing whatever. We're spending more. It's wonderful. Um, they investigated the complaint and said, well, given that it's completely untrue, you shouldn't say it. And they said, yes, we agree. And then they did nothing. There were 23 press officers in the Department of Health who appear to have one job, which is to tell you that everything's getting better. Oh, and that you're individually responsible for your health. Yeah, eat less, exercise more. A any other questions? Yes? Well, I'll make a comment. Yeah. Statistician, and before that, I was um, the chief medical statistician. And uh, I have to tell you that, um, in my view, that however you know great Ed Humperson is, I personally believe that the statistics profession was um, actually better at producing stuff that would rattle cages um, before we had this great you know edifice of pretending, you know, everything is more independent and, and better than it was before. Because as in those posts, I mean, A, we work very, very closely with the chief medical officers in the Department of Health, and B, you know, basically, you know, we publish a huge amount of stuff, you know, for example, about, you know, the impact of a pill on abortion rates, that, you know, against the department's view, we publish all kinds of stuff about HIV impact, suicide in young people, uh, the whole, uh, we started all that work in Britain on a healthy life expectancy. And I think, you know, I don't know that the people in ONS, don't, I don't know them anymore, um, but I think, you know, they just, they're in a position where they can actually um, do this stuff if they want to. And I, I think that, that when, have we got, we haven't got the new national statistician yet, I don't think. Um, you know, maybe they should be encouraged to, you know, be more interested in it because there has been over the last five and ten, and since I went, a huge emphasis on statistics about the economy, and much less emphasis on statistics about what's going on in our society, and that's another kind of part of it. So it's up, it's up to statistics, you know, to put their hand up and do things. In my view, I think it's just another question behind you there. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for your talk. I'm, my name's John Watson, and I'm from King's Health Partners. And recently, uh, we had a talk from Chris Whitty, the new Chief Medical Officer. He's only been in the job four days, but anyway. And I, my question to you is, have you discussed these with him? Because when he gave his talk, he showed not the up-to-date data, but he showed some similar data to that that you have shown him. And he lamented the data in the sort of step because we were going on about going and helping other countries. And he said, well, what about helping the equipment to other countries that are in trouble that exist within our own country, mm. if you follow? And uh, I, I was rather impressed with it. So I don't know whether you personally yeah. have sat down and bent his ear. Um, I, I haven't yet. 
the test will be, his first report will be January, February when it's published. They'll be deciding now the content, which will be written in October, November. So all he's got to do is mention it's happened. And he beats all the other chief medical officers since the beginning of the crisis. Um, that, that's all he's got to do. The report for Scotland in the worst ever year of Scottish health, the report that came out for Scotland headlined over-prescribing of drugs as the problem, which, OK, yeah, is a problem. But to decide in the year of the worst ever Scottish health to do that... Um, but I, I think it has to... I mean, the key thing is, because it's carried on getting worse and worse and worse, and there may be a lull at some point, as there have been before, there does come a point when it might just be impossible not to mention uh, this. It, it would be good. It, it's politically hard because... If it turns out that a key reason, the key reason, is the biggest cuts to service funding, particularly adult social care, ever, then it is, you're, t you're saying to your paymaster, you are the reason. And I can understand why that's difficult. Um, but just saying that there is a problem and this is getting worse, that isn't difficult. Um, and it may be related. OK, I think we've just got time for one more question, so just here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for a very super talk. Uh, my name is Ian Rawls. I'm a pediatrician for the health um, clinic at um, Edward Medicine's Consultant. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, very interested in um, what you said about people starting to think it's a price worth paying. Yeah. Um, I think that's fascinating. I agree with you. I think it's hugely alarming. So my, my first and less important question is, is for paying for what? Uh, what is it worth for? Um, and, and a more important question is, so then what do we do about it? I agree with you, reluctantly, shouting about it is not enough. Mm. So what do we do about it? Okay. Um, very quick answer. I think, I think it hit me when one of the nicest Conservative MPs, Peter Bottomley, said to me when I was presenting these statistics in the House of Commons, he said, Danny, it's only one extra child in 1,000. Uh, and compared to the rate he's in his life, I could, I could see why, it, why it's low. Um, I think the, the easiest way to do something about it, and we're fortunate, the biggest rise in terms of numbers of people and dropping life expectancy appears most recently to be places like Cheltenham and Bournemouth. And I think if you point out it's Cheltenham and Bournemouth, and it's where you, if you are in power in Britain, are going to end up in your retirement, remember, these are people in their 80s and 90s in the main. Only the middle class get to live to their 80s or 90s. Um, so it's us, and it's our parents who don't live with us. We're 20 times more likely to take our adult children back than we are to ever allow our parent into our home. BHBS shows us that. Um, so I would go for selfishness. I, I would go for it is us, our parents, it is the middle class, it is the south of England and the elderly, um, and see whether that works. And try to get people to think about their own last year of life. And because we never think about our own mortality... Uh, we don't. I mean, and it's terrible to say, just go for raw personal selfishness. Um, but I think raw personal selfishness is possibly one, one way of, of doing this. Um, because you've got to think, where have the care workers gone who were working in the homes in the past? Uh, one of the theories we have is that the introduction of the hostile environment meant that people with dubious paperwork from countries where it's not easy to come into Britain who were staffing an old-age people's home in London, left. What do you do then? You hire whoever you can get, and the next thing you know, Panorama is showing hidden camera footage of their behaviour. And that's our last year of life. You know, the trick is get rid of the hostile environment so you can get good people to care, uh, but also monitor these things and worry about it. Untangling exactly why this has happened will be difficult. It has to be very different reasons for the infants, which began in 215, than for the elderly women in 212, than for the more and more people dying in care homes, young children dying in care homes, the deaths on the streets. They're all different. But the only group who I haven't found evidence of increased mortality in Britain are prisoners in prisons, because the suicide rate got so high in the past that actually that has flatlined and not got worse. Um, but... It just needs working out. But selfishly for ourselves, forgetting about people in prisons, people in care homes, people on the streets, uh, the middle class, elderly of Britain, our parents and us, what's going to happen to us? Okay.
Thank you very much, Danny. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm George Blubidis uh, presenting work uh, we did with Stephen Givraz, Alisa Goodman, and Vendetta Ponziglione. Now, if you see the title, you might think I, I will say something very controversial, right? That life expectancy is not stalling or declining. No, um, this, is because, this title is because this work started when we thought life expectancy was still increasing. But what I'm about to talk today is really another trend, uh, which is a long-term trend that has been, I guess, around for a long time and might underlie the recent developments in life expectancy that it's stalling and as we heard previously, actually it might be declining. Now, a bit of overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, behind this work, I uh, was testing theories of population health change. That was what we're interested in and are still interested in, in doing. And this is mostly about the joint progress of health and mortality. This is what we're interested in. Uh, the question we're trying to answer was whether the additional years that more recently born cohorts have gained and are years of good health or years of disability and frailty. Put it more simply, are, recently, are more recently born cohorts healthier than previous older <laughs> cohorts? I'm going to present findings from the Health Survey for England and the British birth cohorts, very briefly. And then in the end, I will try to link all those findings with why, with the reason we're here today, I guess, implications for life expectancy. Very briefly, the theories of population health change. There are three of those. So compression of morbidity, the oldest, I guess, the, maybe the most well-known one, which assumes that life expectancy will reach its biological limits. Of course, that never happens, right? And obviously, uh, what, we're, what happens in the UK as we speak is it has, not, has nothing to do with any biological limit. The idea behind this is that uh, the average onset of morbidity will be, is postponed, so years of poor health are compressed. That's a good scenario. Of course, compression can still occur if healthy life expectancy grows faster than total life expectancy. When we started doing this work, that was the idea that we were testing. It assumes that interventions outside the medical system will be effective, so you have removal of major risk factors. On the other hand, on the other end of the continuum, you have ex the expansion of morbidity theory, the idea behind this is that medical advances push down mortality rates of the major drivers of uh, death, of mortality. At the same time, the epidemiology remains the same, the major risk factors remain the same. So years of ill health at the end of life increase. That's not good, right? That's bad news. And somewhere in between, uh, maybe not as simple as that, but not having time today to go much further into it, there's the, the dynamic equilibrium theory which is a more sort of lesser continuation of the status quo. I mean, the years spent with ill health remain the same over time. Now, we can test this question with, of course, calculating healthy life expectancy and so on. And we did that. But since in the UK we have a lot of surveys, a lot of data, longitudinal surveys or cross repeated cross-sections as the Health Survey for England, a very simple idea is to bring, to bring in a regression approach to this. Simply testing a year of birth health association. Now, when you do this, there is a lot of flexibility because you can control for measurement error, bring in various vari other variables to test for interaction, equality, and so on. Of course, very interestingly as well, uh, year of the year of birth health association cannot be confounded. There's no plausible confounder that can explain away this. So whatever we're observing, it's an effect, really. So quickly to move on to the actual results of, from various data sets. So the first paper we did on that, which is still under review, is from the Health Survey for England. So we're using repeated annual cross-sections uh, from 1993 to 2013. Keep that in mind. It's, it's important. About 135,000 participants who have various health measures, some self-reported ones and some observed measured. We created synthetic cohorts from the annual cross-sections. So it's you know, representing different generations. We did both a multivariable logic uh, approach and we calculated healthy life expectancy with, this, with Sullivan's method. You can think of this as triangulation, methods with different underlying assumptions, and so on. Importantly, which is important also for results that we present from the British birth cohorts, we have done a lot of methodological work to establish between cohort equivalence of self-reported measures to, to ensure that whatever difference between generations we're observing is not due to some 
difference in response style. Let's, let's say uh, people born in the 70s are more likely to endure to say that they're in bad health compared to those born earlier or later and so on. So some results. Um, the number, you know, the, there is a very simple color scheme to that. Perp you know, the, the orange is bad news, is expansion of morbidity, which means for all those indicators, observer to ones like uh, long-standing illness, self-rated health, but glass hemoglobin or being overweight, which have been observed measured, we found that more recently born cohorts, you know, are expected to spend more years in bad health. There is, there are two exceptions, but that's the overwhelming scenario. Now, remember, because this is until 2013, when life expectancy was still increasing, there is a scenario where still you can get expansion of morbidity, but also, but, but the more recently born cohort not being, cohorts not being less healthy, but having similar health to previous cohorts. But if you look at the numbers, to make, make that easier with those, uh, uh, with those, uh, with those images, uh, that in those, in these particular health indicators, more recently born cohorts were less healthy. So another finding from this paper, which I think is very interesting, we're picking up strong interactions with educational level. So if we bring in education into the model, uh, those with uh, degrees, no qualifications, some qualifications, you will see that those with degrees that have a university degree, actually their pattern, on, and actually to, to make it easier, on the, on the x-axis you have the year of birth, the cohort, on the, on the y-axis the probability of poor health on various indicators, you will see that those with a university degree, the pattern is very, very different. Actually, for those with a university degree, expansion, expansion of morbidity doesn't happen. It's compression. It's like these people live, people from different economic backgrounds live in a different country, really, if you look at those patterns. Okay, so in the health survey for England, we're picking up this trend. This trend is more recently born cohorts are less healthy. And up to 2013, when life expectancy was increasing, this was going to lead to expansion of morbidity. But there are some issues, right? I mean, we created synthetic cohorts. But now in the UK, we're very lucky, right? We happen to have four national birth cohort studies. One of them housed in, the, you know, is in this building uh, recently, and the, the rest in UCL as well, all four of those. The rest are just next door in the Center for Longitudinal Studies where I work. So let's see what happens in the cohorts. Are we replicating what we're picking up from the Health Survey for England? This is a paper by Will Johnson and colleagues. These are the three lines represent on obesity. The three lines represent the three adult cohorts, like the BCS-70, born 1970, 1958, and 1946, you will see in all quintiles of, of BMI, there is a gradient. The more recently born cohorts are more likely to be obese, which makes sense. You can, th you can think of it, okay, we're in the era of obesity epidemic. It's not only obesity. Self-rated health. Now we're comparing those born in 1970 and 1958. Again, those born in 1970, they're more likely to report poor self-rated health. Very importantly, I believe, we, p we pick up the same trends with mental health, with psychological distress, which is components of depression and anxiety symptoms. We published a paper a couple of years ago comparing those born in 1970 and those born in 1958 at age 42. You will see that the prevalence of psychological distress in those born in 1970 at the same age goes up, especially in men. Keep that in mind. It might be relevant with a couple of slides I present later. So there is an increase, and of course, with a lot of work on that to make sure that this is not due to the more recently born cohort simply endorsing, you know, uh, depression or anxiety symptoms, saying I don't feel well. This is a true. This is a finding that holds. Now, when we bring in the oldest cohort, the 1946 cohort, and compare it across the life course with those born in 1958 and 1970, again we're getting the same trend. There's a very clear gradient. The more recently born cohorts, higher psychological distress. Now. Not only that, very, very timely on Wednesday, if you look at the left-hand side of this slide, we publish a systematic review on population health change in the UK, bringing in evidence not only from longitudinal <coughs> surveys, but administrative data, whatever. We pick up exactly the same trend. More recently born cohorts are less healthy. Okay, what does this mean for life expectancy? Now, more recently born cohorts have worse health. That's a long-term trend. It didn't, doesn't, didn't happen now in the last five or 10 years. 
inequality is definitely, is, I believe, a part of the mechanism. We have also published a systematic review showing this. Now, if life expectancy were to continue to increase, or in some time, some point in the future continues to increase, that means we have expansion of morbidity. Bad news, right? More years spent in ill health. Similarly, if life expectancy stalls, it will, the same scenario will occur, because morbidity, the onset of morbidity will not be postponed. So you can have a scenario where life expectancy stalls, flat lines, which might be the case, right? But people still spend more years in ill health, which is the worst case scenario, I guess. Now, is stalling life expectancy, or as we heard on the previous talk from the latest evidence, maybe a decline, right? Due to worsening of population health. If this is the case, there are, I think there are two mechanisms that may explain this. There must, there must be an increase in most post-morbidity mortality in older ages. So there is onset of morbidity, and then mortality increases. And then, of course, you can link this with worse access to health care, for example, or no health care. Of course, that can be linked maybe with austerity and so on. Or you, can have a, you may have an increase in premature mortality. Now, what I find very interesting, and we're doing some more work on that in the cohorts, is that both of those mechanisms imply that the association between mortality and health is stronger in more recently born cohorts. Now, if you think about it, that goes against the basic premise of the epidemiologic transition, which is actually the association between health and mortality is weakening in more recent generations. And of course, a very important question, what if this is the case, which is a huge structural shift, and it might be happening, the big question is why now? And of course, you can think of various explanations, as we heard in the previous talk, about austerity, inequality, and so on. Now, I will finish by just presenting two slides from from with external information. Is there any evidence for these two mechanisms? So we're picking up this decline in population health, more recently born cohorts from various sources. We're picking up the same trend in various indicators. More recently born cohorts are less healthy. Is there evidence for these two mechanisms? So this is a slide from uh, Alzheimer's Research UK. You see the various causes of that. That's, a, that's up until 2017. It's not the most up-to-date results, of course, data. You see deaths from dementia and Alzheimer going up. And this holds also if you can account for mistakes in coding, not mistakes in coding, near a new coding and so on. And that is maybe some evidence for the post onset of morbidity increase in mortality rates. Furthermore, Angus Deaton in the uh, IFS Review of Inequality presented this slide recently. This is middle-aged mortality in England. And you see that especially in men, the deaths of despair are going up. And this to me looks that is linked really well with the increase in midlife mental health that we have shown in the birth cohorts. Obviously, I know Jennifer will be talking about this, so uh, I look forward to see whether actually this, is, this happens and so on. So to wrap up, it looks like we're not living longer. Life expectancy is stalling, and it might be also declining. What I have shown today is that from various sources, the Health Service for England, the British birth cohorts, but as we have shown in the systematic review that was just published two days ago, uh, which is open access, go for guys, read it, make, make up your own minds. We're picking up a systematic trend, which means, which is more recently born cohorts are less healthy. There is also a little bit of evidence, and I think this long-term trend may, may underlie what we're observing recently, the increase in mortality rates. A couple of acknowledgements, various people have worked on this, who have various papers that have been published or coming along. Thank you for your attention. Happy to answer questions. I'm confused. Right. That's something you mentioned where the biggest impact is happening in the very eldest cohort, those who have been born in the 40s, mm -hmm. where the one who you is, uh, is affected immediately through decreases in health. That's happening in the 50s and 60s, and the change we see in life expectancy there are probably the smallest and in cohorts of Harry Square, those two pieces of data. Uh, look, these all the well, it's it's a function of the data, right? I mean, by the way, we have a paper on the ELSA, which with even older cohorts, which um, in a sense replicates those findings, right? This day, but to me, what this shows is that even in more in cohorts, in the post-war cohorts, you're start you're starting seeing this trend, and if this trend continues, the, the decline that the more recently born cohorts have are less healthy, then probably if it continues and we're and we will see a further increase in mortality rates. I don't, I don't, I don't think these, these two things are kind of, are, you know, are, I don't think there's an antithesis there. 
between these two findings. I just were talking about different generations. I don't think there is a structural break with pre and post war, but I'm just presenting evidence that in post war there, are, there is a definitely a trend where more recently, more recently born cohorts are less healthy. And I think it's this is starting to show on mortality, on some specific mortality rates as well. Okay, good question. Thanks, George. Thank you. Um, So in this presentation, it's fortunately it's slightly different to the one that was in the abstract, but I'm going to be reporting on the inequality in avoidable mortality, and with regard to the trend really from 2001 through to 2017, um, because it's quite useful to know, um, you know, whether avoidable mortality uh, trends are actually replicated or replicating those general trends that we've seen recently. So just for some context, ONS reduced life expectancy by area deprivation for England and Wales. Um, we sort of looked at the difference between 2012-14 and 2015-17, and we found that inequalities were widening quite markedly. There were significant increases in the inequality in England, so that now for males, there's a 9.4 year gap um, between the least and most deprived areas. And for females, it's 7.4 years. So clearly, um, there's you know, growing inequalities during this period where, we've, where we're seeing mortality um, improvement stalling. So how did these come about? Well, um, there's quite marked contrast, really, between the most deprived areas where you're seeing a real stalling in life expectancy between those periods. But you're also seeing statistically significant increases um, in life expectancy amongst the least deprived areas. So for males, um, it's, it's, it's a case of stalling, but continued improvement in the, in the least deprived areas. For, for females, it's different. We have a reduction in life expectancy of almost 100 days in England, which we found, which is a statistically significant fall. Um, it's even greater in Wales, although it wasn't statistically significant because of precision issues. But this is sort of showing really that, you know, we, we're, in a, we're in a scenario now where um, there's actually social patterning in the trajectory in life expectancy. So as I say, the focus of this presentation is much more concentrated on avoidable mortality. This is um, causes of death which are deemed amenable or preventable. Amenable is really those causes which are, um, could be avoided through effective health care, whereas the preventable uh, causes of death are those which are um, much more um, uh, avoidable through wider public health actions aimed at reducing disease incidence. They also have quite a, a strong alignment to premature mortality and um, it's useful really for us to get a, a feel for how this stalling pattern is actually um, playing out amongst different populations exposed to different levels of deprivation in two distinct periods. So just very briefly, avoidable deaths constitute approximately 23% of, of total deaths. Um, and of those, 34% are malignant neoplasms, 25% roughly are cardiovascular disease, which makes up about three-fifths of avoidable deaths. And then the remainder are um, injuries, which are predominantly external causes, respiratory disease, and also drug use disorders with some other categories um, as well. So it was in 2017, really, that ONS decided we, we, we wanted to produce a, a fairly long trend in avoidable mortality. And it was really in response to the changing trends um, that we'd sort of been reported in academia, but also we were seeing in our life expectancy analyses. Um, so we used uh, area deprivation measures, which were temporal to the actual years of data that we looked at. And we did this for Wales as well, although I'm going to focus predominantly on England in this presentation. So as we see in this sort of first period, which is between 2001 and 2013, we've got quite uh, strong falls in avoidable mortality, um, both in the most deprived areas as well as the least deprived areas. Um, you know, you've got an annual fall of 2.4% amongst most deprived men, whereas um, you've also got an annual fall of 1.9% amongst most deprived females in, in that first period. But as we can see, the, um, the, you know, the contrast in the improvement is somewhat different once you get to the 2014-17 period. The reason why I'm choosing those years is because avoidable mortality went through a definition change, 
which, in, which, which meant that the definition contained more respiratory disease deaths um, than the earlier definition. So we're getting falls in the annual, in, in the annual um, rate of improvement for males in decile 1 and 4, and also for in decile 10 males and decile 10 females. And there's actually a slight rise in avoidable mortality in this period for females in the most deprived areas. When we sort of extend this to all deprivation deciles, we can see that, you know, again, the, the contrast really between the earlier period, the first decade and the second decade, you know, quite marked um, percentage falls in the annual rate of improvement, which are, which are indicated by the red blocks. Um, I mean, decile one, for instance, the most deprived men are where it, uh, their sort of annual rate of improvement fell by 80%. Whereas the least deprived areas seem to be more protected from this um, falling pattern. However, they still reduce by 44%. If we, ex if we um, now look towards females, it's even more kind of socioeconomically patterned where you're actually seeing an increase, as I said, in, in female mortal avoidable mortality in the second period. But there are, but there are at least three de deciles there which you know, have seen falls of um, more than 90% in the annual rate of improvement. So now let's look at um, some disease-specific contrasts. Again, this is cardiovascular disease mortality, avoidable cardiovascular disease mortality between 2001 and 2017. The definition didn't actually change for this cause of, these causes of death. So the contrasts that I'm looking at are um, between 2001-11 and 2011-17. And males in decile 1 saw quite a steep fall in their avoidable mortality during this period. It, it reduced by 135 deaths per 100,000, constituting a 4.5% annual contraction in the rate of avoidable death. And there was also um, strong falls for females in decile 1 as well. Um, but when we look to the period post 2011, you know the the, the actual falls, um, you know, contract quite markedly really. So it's it's down to sort of 0.9 percent for males, 0.8 uh, percent for females in the most deprived areas. Interestingly, I mean, the most deprived females in the least deprived area, sorry, the least deprived females, were sort of um, just uh, continued to um, experience quite a a strong performance in the second period, maintaining a 4.7% improvement. These are avoidable deaths caused by injuries. Um, because there's a smaller number of deaths, um, the year-to-year -year fluctuations are, are, are much more marked here. Again, the injuries definition didn't change between uh, across the whole time period, so the contrast that we're doing here is 2001-11 and 2011-17. Um, in, de in decile 1 males, we see sort of modest falls, really, between 2001 and 2011. Um, but, but after 2011, you know, we're, we're seeing in the rate of injury, avoidable injury death, increasing annually by 2.8%. And ONS actually found that between 2011 and 2017, there was a 16% rise in avoidable deaths from injuries amongst males living in the most deprived areas. Um, for females, it's, it's quite a, it's a, sh a shallow sort of picture. There was a very, a very kind of slight rise between 2001 and 2013. I mean, the low point was in 2006, but by 2013, the rate of injury deaths was actually commensurate with what, what, was, um, what was happening in 2001. And again, since then, it's increased for females too. Um, having an annual rise of 2.7% in the most deprived areas. Um, but I mean, across all kind of strata here, you're seeing rises in, in injury mortality, avoidable injuries, um, which is quite interesting in this, in this later period. And now respiratory disease. Um, for, for males in decile 1, we sort of have quite a, a fluctuating picture, but by um, 2013, after sort of because respiratory diseases change the, defini the definition of avoidable death from respiratory disease change. These are now going back to the contrast between 2001 and 13. Um, we're seeing we're seeing an annual percentage fall of 1.1% in respiratory in avoidable respiratory disease mortality 
between 2013 and for males in decile one, but it is quite up and down. Um, but sort of since then, um, with those additional respiratory disease deaths included in the definition, um, we are seeing a rise of 1.9%. Similar kind of pattern really for the um, males in decile 10, it was slightly stronger falls between 2001 and 13, but they too are having a, an annual rise of 1.9% 1 1 um, in this later period. And for females, there was very, as I said, there was very little change in decile one, but rising in the second period by 2.1%. Um, and it's only really decile 10 females, the least deprived, that sustained a fall in the second period. So what has those sort of changes in avoidable mortality had in terms of the inequality? So this is showing the slope index of inequality male avoidable, avoidable, amenable, and preventable mortality in England between 2001 and 2017. So as we can see, you know, between 2001 and 2017, we've got quite strong um, reductions in the absolute inequality uh, falling from 461 to 341. Um, and the same really for preventable and amenable. In fact, amenable reduced the most, reduced by 3.1% per year, the, the, the scale of the inequality. However, since um, 2000, from the 2014-17 period, we see inequalities actually um, higher than they were in 2013. This is with a new definition that, you know, on, on the face of it, the new definition should be, should be um, the effect should be the same across all deprivation strata if, it, if it's an equal effect. Um, we're actually seeing, you know, quite a, quite a severe contraction in the absolute inequality. So it's now only improving by 0.3% per year from 2014. And for preventable mortality, again, a very, a very slight um, fall, a much slower rate of, of improvement. Um, and for amenable mortality, it's actually increased. And for women, the picture is fairly similar. I mean, there, was, there were obviously a bit more peaks and troughs in the, in the trend between 2001 and 2013. But since um, 2014, you know, we're having increases in all three in, um, measures here. Um, and amenable mortality actually going up by, I think it was, I think it was 1.7%. Um, yeah. So for females, it's Fall, a falling picture of inequality during between 2001 and 13, but, but a rising picture of inequality since 2014. So what do these sort of figures tell us? Well, um, in terms of avoidable mortality, which is a subset of all deaths, which is mainly focusing on younger populations, we're actually seeing um, you know, a slowing across all sort of deprivation deciles. Um, in the second period compared to the first period. The extent of the slowing is stronger amongst the most deprived populations. Um, and I think it's sort of an obvious, very strong example of this is in cardiovascular disease mortality, which represents 25% of avoidable deaths. The actual um, slowdown in the rate of improvement is obviously affecting you know, the, the general um, avoidable mortality uh, trend. Um, we sort of need to look into more why there's been rises in avoidable deaths caused by respiratory disease and injuries, um, because those, you know, are to some extent worrying, and um, you know there may well be reasons why um, people are becoming more susceptible to these sorts of deaths at these ages. And I think I think the the thing to to say is that. You know, that given the scale of inequality both we have in life expectancy and also in avoidable mortality, um, there does seem to be scope to return to a quicker um, mortal mortality improvement trajectory through mitigating um, the scale of inequality that, that exists. Um, so, and I think, and I think another another interesting finding in this is that. When, we've, when we're in a period where mortality is actually falling quite rapidly, as in the noughties, um, that does seem to be, it, it does seem to have the effect of reducing the inequality. 
the absolute inequality. But in periods where mortality is stalling, actually inequalities are, are either persisting at the same level or rising. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Um, ten minutes isn't a long time to cover what is a large and very complex subject, but um, I'll be focusing particularly around three areas. Um, I'll first look at life expectancy trends in, in England in relation to what's happening in Europe. Um, I'll then look at three particular areas which are contributing to the slowdown in life expectancy improvements. And finally, I'll say something about why we need to understand, why we need to improve our understanding of what's happening and how that can be done. And just to be clear, because there are many different measures of life expectancy, I'll be talking throughout about life expectancy, at period life expectancy at birth. So essentially, by way of background, um, we've already had it outlined to us, the financial constraints and austerity-related constraints facing all public services, and um, the NHS hasn't been immune to that, and social care has actually seen very significant cuts over the past 10 years, eight years. Um, it's unlikely that these financial pressures on health and care services will ease significantly in years to come. Um, we, then th we therefore think that it's imperative for resources to be prioritized and used most effectively. And that requires an evidence-based approach to defining priorities. So we're arguing really for a quite a detailed diagnostic forensic examination of what's causing extra deaths among which population groups. Um, and the way to do that is through some more epidemiological analyses. There's been quite a lot of work done by Public Health England, by ONS and by other researchers to shed light in terms of what's happening. But our understanding of this is, is still incomplete and I think there's further way to go. Um, because such analyses can identify not just the direct causes of death but the factors contributing to those deaths. And that's really important because particularly since a lot of the stalling in life expectancy is coming from older ages, with multimorbidity in, at, at older ages, we do need to understand what the key or multiple drivers are. And we also need to look at what's happening beyond um, England to see if there's any lessons to be drawn there. Um, even two years ago, we really had very little understanding of what the underlying drivers were, but there's been quite a lot of work done since then, including the review by Public Health England, which was commissioned um, to essentially do an examination of what's causing the stalling in life expectancy. Um, the consistent finding, and we've already heard about it today from uh, Chris and Professor Dawling and others, is about widening inequalities. Um, to be clear, the stalling in life expectancy is impacting on all areas, the most deprived and the least deprived. But it's impacting more on the more deprived areas. So the difference in, in, uh, in life expectancy is widening. And also in, amongst the females in the most deprived areas, life expectancy is falling. Thank you. Um, a major contribution to this stalling is the slowdown in CVD mortality improvement. I'll say something about this um, further along the line, but CVD is a leading cause of death in, in males and is the second leading cause of death in females. So, um, and the slowdown in mortality improvement has made a major contribution to what's happening to life expectancy. Um, in some winters, there have been excessive deaths, especially amongst older people, um, associated with flu, pneumonia, and respiratory disease. And as I'll go on to show, these have contributed to very erratic patterns and erratic annual changes in mortality, and which will have made some contribution 
to the slowdown. Um, some papers refer to the issue, and George earlier referred to it, about epidemiological transition. We uh, have an aging population with larger numbers of older people, and the patterns um, of mortality change are changing, and that sort of comes through in some of the data I'll show you. Um, and this particular paper, which um, analyzed, this is based on the Global Burden of Disease Study, and they comment on the multiple condition-specific and possibly cohort-specific components, including changing exposure to risk factors. So there's a number of different things going on, and I think we need to get to the bottom of all of it. I don't think there's a single bullet answer. Um, so apart from what's happening in older people, um, it's really important to note that um, mortality in young adults is rising, mortality rates from accidental poisoning, much of that is drug-related, is, is rising. It doesn't have a huge impact on life expectancy, but it has made a small contribution in terms of a negative impact on life expectancy. Um, and the analyses done by PhD and others shows that the stalling of life expectancy is happening across many areas, many age groups, many causes of death. So it's pretty much across the piece. So to put this in, in the European context, um, I'm sorry if it's a bit busy, this slide, but um, if I could just focus your attention on two aspects of it. One is levels. So the thick red line is UK. Um, the Eurostat data only looks at UK. It doesn't look at England separately. Um, and that shows where UK sits in relation to a selection of EU countries. Um, it would have been too busy to put all European countries on there. Um, and I haven't included any East European countries because they tend pretty characteristically and historically to have much lower levels of life expectancy. So UK doesn't compare very well for amongst men in, in the countries I've chosen, we sit about the middle of the pack, but are rapidly being overtaken by a number of countries. Um, the green line is interesting, that's Ireland, showing a very significant increase. But even countries with much higher levels than us um, show more rapid improvement. We compare particularly badly for life expectancy amongst females. Um, we're sitting at the bottom there and pretty much flatlining whereas other countries, a number of other countries, are showing improvements. This is data to 2017. Um, the 2018 data will be out next year, so it'll be interesting to see what that shows. The second aspect of this graph to notice is in recent years, particularly since 2014, the very erratic changes in life expectancy. Now, these are life expectancy figures at national level, so this is not statistical aberration. It's not noise in the data. These changes are real. And some p points to note. Uh, firstly, as I said, the more erratic pattern in recent years, particularly amongst women. Secondly, many countries show a very sharp rise in life expectancy in 2014, followed by a very sharp fall in 2015, which Professor Dawling referred to. That fall is seen pretty much across Europe, and it's very sizable in some countries. In some countries like um, Italy and France, life expectancy fell by half a year. That's a lot in one year. Life expectancy then tends to pick up a bit in 2016, and in some countries it flatlines in 2017, but in some, Italy and Spain, you see a fall again in 2017. So in terms of the diagnostics, I think it's useful to ask what is causing this. This is life expectancy showing consistent changes across an entire continent, and that warrants some explanation, or at least some investigation. And interestingly, while there's been a lot of interest in this subject in UK and, of course, in the US, um, there's been very little commentary across Europe on this. I haven't seen any strong evidence that explains these patterns, but related to this, there is data from European um, mortality and flu monitoring and surveillance organizations. 
um, reporting on annual winter um, levels of excess mortality, including that as, um, associated with flu. And that shows that the levels of um, excess winter and flu-related mortality, the peaks and troughs sort of mirror what's happening here. Now, I don't think they or I could establish cause and effect or say definitively this is the case, but it certainly warrants explanation. For instance, in 2014, flu mortality and winter mortality was very low across Europe, whereas 2015 saw the spread of very virulent strain of flu and very low vaccine efficacy. Um, so I think that's something worth looking at. Um, this slide, again a bit busy, and I've chosen a slightly wider range of countries here, but if I can talk you through it. So the upper black horizontal bars show change in life expectancy over the period 2005-11, that's six years, and the blue, bar, the, uh, the blue dots show the change in life expectancy between 2011 and 17. Um, again, this is the latest data that's available for Europe. Um, and I think two things to look out for. One is the length of the bars. You notice from this that the stalling, the slowdown in the life expectancy improvements is pretty much consistent across the piece. And in this graph, I've included some East European countries, um, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, because their life expectancy is much lower, and you would expect that they would somehow <coughs> be able to maintain their rates of improvement, but even there you see a stalling in life expectancy. The other point to note is the level of the blue dots, because that differs a lot. Uh, UK is very much to the left of this graph, which shows that stalling here has been most pronounced. Um, but there has been stalling in other countries as well, not to the same degree. Um, but Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, and France, countries where um, austerity had less bite, but have really stalled quite a lot. Um, that said, what these two graphs that I've just shown you do show that UK compares very badly and is, is doing very badly in terms of changes over time. So this is a very um, select snapshot of data, it's age standardized mortality rates for England for quarter one from 2001 to 2019, that's the latest data for this, right up to this year, so it's very current data. Um, it's data only for one quarter, so it's not the full year, but I've chosen it to make a few points about it. Um, again, you see that there's been a steady sort of fall in quarter one mortality, but in recent years we're seeing very sharp peaks and troughs. And these years coincide with the years in the previous graph that I showed you. So 2014, um, 2015 sees a very sharp rise in mortality in winter, um, coming on the back of very much lower mortality in 2014. So there's something happening here that's making um, quarter one mortality very erratic. And again, these peaks and troughs coincide what, with what the European monitoring agencies, um, Euromomo and the European Centre for Disease Control and so on, are reporting in relation to flu and winter deaths. And a similar pattern is seen across Europe. Um, just to stress, this is only one quarter mortality um, it is winter mortality, so this has a disproportionate effect on the year's, um, the year's figures. But it is just one quarter. And um, data for the summer months also shows stalling in life expectancy. It doesn't show these peaks and troughs, but it also shows um, stalling in mortality. So this isn't only a sort of winter or a flu phenomenon. I'm not saying flu is either the sole or the main contributor, but it's one factor. And I mention it because I think it's important to unpick this complex issue of what's happening to life expectancy because there's a, a lot of different drivers here. 
Um, so this graph looks at um, deaths, op deaths related to opioids. I think you're probably all very familiar with the opioid crisis in the United States. It's a well-known story. It's led to falling life expectancy in for three years in USA. But this problem is going wider. So the OECD published a report just last month on the opioid crisis across OECD countries. And it mentions um, the rising levels of opioid-related deaths in certain countries. Specifically, it mentions England, Wales, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, and also Canada. So it's a really disparate set of countries that this issue is surfacing in. Uh, Canada is very interesting. Uh, Statistics Canada just reported their life expectancy figures for up to 2017. And after years, after decades of improving life expectancy, between 2016 and 17, their life expectancy flatlined. And it was entirely due to the opioid crisis. Um, Again, it's striking very much in young adults, especially young adult males. And accidental deaths are now the third leading cause of death in Canada. So I think uh, this is, again, just to illustrate this, of course, you know, opioids will probably make a very tiny bit of difference to life expectancy in this country. But uh, my pitch here is to say, if there are other countries showing similar epidemiological patterns, I think you know, we should be looking there should be a dialogue ongoing to try and find out what's, uh, whether there are commonalities. Uh, CVD mortality, I've said already that that's been a big um, contributor to the stalling of life expectancy. And Chris showed it's also been a big uh, contributor to um, widening inequalities in amenable mortality. So historically, UK did not have very good CVD mortality re rates in relation to many other countries, but we've shown greater improvements than many over the years. But, and, and CVD mortality has fallen dramatically since the 1970s. There have been seminal falls in, in, in CVD which have driven the increases in life expectancy that we've seen. But despite these falls, it is now beginning to slow down. And that is troubling because CVD is still a leading cause of death. Heart disease is the number one killer in men. And stroke follows not far behind. And uh, heart disease is the second, second biggest killer in women. So it is still a big killer. And I think if we're going to turn the life expectancy ship around, then this has to be an area for attention. It's a significant contributor to inequalities in life expectancy. Uh, many of the risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease are, don't just show large inequalities, but some of those inequalities are widening. So smoking prevalence has fallen dramatically in this country. It's a real success story. But inequalities in smoking prevalence are widening as are inequalities in childhood obesity. So what's driving this slowdown in CVD mortality improvements? Um, there's no evidence that AMI case fatality or stroke case fatality is deteriorating. So if you have a heart attack or a stroke, there's no evidence you're more likely to die now. Um, but um, a number of studies, including the Global Burden of Disease study, show that there is scope for primary and secondary prevention. So primary prevention means you stop people getting the disease, which means there's still a lot of residual scope for targeting risk factors like smoking. And of course, we know obesity is, is rising. Um, I think in deprived areas, one in three children is, is obese. Um, and for secondary prevention, we still have pretty high levels, despite improvements in blood pressure and cholesterol control. Um, there is some of these risk factors. There's still scope for better detection, diagnosis, and early treatment. But again, the slowdown in CVD mortality improvements is not unique to this country. It's happening 
in a number of European countries. And it's uh, happening also in the USA. Uh, just on that, to add, um, the King's Fund is working with the OECD on some of these wider pan-European uh, life expectancy issues, and we are hosting, uh, we are coordinating a workshop with them in Paris in November, which will look at international trends in CVD mortality and what may be causing the slowdown. So, to conclude, um, as background, you are probably aware that UK does not compare very favorably with European peers in terms of spending and health and social care, whether as a proportion of GDP or per capita. Um, we've been through very tight fiscal times, and there's no evidence that the public's purse strings are going to be loosened or there's going to be a bonanza around the corner. Um, the NHS has been given a slight reprieve with the 20 billion over the next five years, but um, the social care has seen significant cuts and NHS services still remain under huge pressure. So we do need to, be, to have evidence-based ways of ensuring that the resources that are available are, are targeted um, and evidence-driven. The evidence also suggests that there are many, many factors at play, both within your, uh, England, but also uh, we need to look further afield. Are there factors? What is unique to England? And what factors may be common across Europe? Uh, why does UK compare so badly with Europe? Is it the fact of widening inequalities? Is that what's pushing our comparison levels down? Um, these, uh, you know, there are no answers to these really very big questions yet. Um, so the ways forward, I think we know quite a lot now. We, all the pieces of the jigsaw are not in place yet. There's plenty we don't know, as I've mentioned. But we do know quite a lot about cardiovascular disease, about drug-related deaths in young adults, about what's happening to female life expectancy in deprived areas, about what's happening to childhood obesity in poor areas. These are things that can be, can, can be actioned now. And we need better understanding of the underlying drivers, both in this country and beyond. Better understanding requires, I think, we need a lot more analysis. We're very lucky in this country because of having a universal healthcare system. We have rich and universal healthcare data sets. I do some work with the OECD, and it's astonishing how richer we are in terms of data than many other countries that don't have the sorts of national data sets that we have here. And I think they could be used and explored much more. Um, ONS, ONS and PHE have done quite a lot, but you know we've seen examples of research today and probably more to follow, but there's a lot a scope to do a lot more. Um, a lot of the analysis of mortality at the moment is based on underlying cause of death, and that becomes increasingly an ineffective way of examining what's happening. Uh, the reason is a lot of the problem lies in older ages. Many of these people who die will be multimorbid. So you need to look not just at underlying cause of death, but also secondary causes of death. And many killer conditions are not even coded as underlying cause of death. Because of this, for instance, most countries like United States, Canada, Australia, Europe, they use proxy methods for estimating mortality from flu because it's seldom recorded on death certificates. So we have the data, you know, we should be learning more. We have linked data sets. We have data sets that link hospital records with mortality records. So you can see what a patient was admitted for, where they were admitted from, what their comorbid conditions were, and what they died of. This all remains at the moment very much in a black box. So we need to do a lot more analysis and um, I think we need to be talking internationally and collaborating internationally with European public health agencies, the European Heart Network, the European Center for Dis um, Monitoring Drugs and Drug Addictions. So I think there's a scope to do a lot more, but we certainly can be acting on what we know. Thank you very much.
to start by kind of motivating what, what got me interested in looking at this angle of, of midlife mortality by talking a little bit about what's been happening in the U.S. Um, and whether we can have similarities or differences across social and political contexts that, you know, that might help explain these trends. Um, as has been mentioned already, the U.S. has um, kind of the leading edge of this stalling and falling life expectancy. Um, so overall life expectancy has actually fallen for three consecutive years in the U.S. Um, and on top of that, we have um, kind of this um, prize of being exceptional in a bad way in that our life expectancy has diverged um, from other OECD countries um, for quite some time. And so there has been for several years now kind of a, um, a drive to understand what's going on in the U.S. from, from that standpoint. Um, and as, as we're gathered here today to, to understand, um, we've recently seen the stalling in life expectancy um, in the UK, this flattening out. And so um, for me, that kind of does beg the question and what we've seen for the other European countries, is this something that the US was kind of on the leading edge of that we might um, also see um, in the UK and different countries, or are there fundamentally different dynamics going on? Um, and the study of rising mortality had been um, happening for, for several years in the US, but was really brought to um, bigger attention by a paper by Angus Deaton and Ann Case in 2015, um, which you might, might have seen. And they really focused on midlife mortality in the US um, to look for the starkest examples of um, increased mortality. And just to point out here that there also this red line that's diverging from everyone else um, is also a specific subgroup of U.S. Um, non-Hispanic whites. Um, so they focus on very specific subgroups in these um, analyses, and that's something I'm going to revisit later that has made it a little more of a challenge to make direct comparisons to what might be going on um, in other countries. So I'll come back to that. Um, and there's been several um, hypotheses kind of put forth about what might be responsible for the increases in mortality in the U.S. Um, You've probably heard about these deaths of despair, as we've, we've heard a little bit already. Um, Case and Deaton proposed a theory in which it's cumulative disadvantage over the life course um, that has really affected employment, um, marriage, and health, um, and was triggered by worsening labor market opportunities by um, cohorts of whites with lower levels of education. And there's been, I know, some discussion that this kind of structural changes in the economy might be going on in, in the UK as well. Um, other scholars, such as Ryan Masters, have um, acknowledged the strong period trend in um, drug-related mortality that we, we just heard about as well, um, due to changes in the prescribing of opioids. Um, but they've raised doubts that trends in other despair-related deaths, such as suicide and alcohol-related deaths, really fit this pattern well. So they've kind of questioned that and pointed a little more towards um, a leveling off of improvements and possibly increases in mortality due to metabolic causes. Um, so I was interested to see some evidence that that slowing down and improvements in, in cardiovascular disease mortality is being seen here too. And, and they kind of argued that this may reflect these much longer term dynamics of the obesity epidemic, that it sort of takes decades of exposure to that to catch up with populations. And demographers have been talking about potential reversals in life expectancy due to the obesity epidemic for quite some time. Um, so, so these kind of two theories were our jumping off point um, for thinking about, and sorry, the, the program said just the UK, but I have a collaborator in Canada, so I'm going to throw in some data from Canada as well. Um, you know, we wanted to think about, is the US really an anomaly with these deaths of despair, or is there evidence um, that these trends are emerging in other countries that you know, are more similar to the US, at least in other European countries? but also do have very different social and political context and certainly healthcare systems. Um, and so the overall project, like many of you here, is to try to understand the role of um, you know, these, the social and political context for population mortality, um, potentially vis-a-vis -vis more generalized trends that are happening long-term with respect to um, obesity and cardiovascular disease. Um, so I really just have some descriptive um, things for you um, in the first instance. Um, we've looked at um, overall all, all registered deaths. Um, it's actually England and Wales. 
and um, also in Canada up to 2016. So I'll be very interested to see the, the more recent 2017 data that was mentioned. Um, and then we're just starting to do a little analysis with the ONS longitudinal study to kind of look at those specific subgroups that um, have been the focus in the US because UK um, death certificates do not have education or race ethnicity um, the way the US does. So it's actually hard with just the um, mortality, raw mortality data to make those comparisons with subgroups. Um, and we were also interested, um, so I know a large focus of the stalling life expectancy here has been on deaths at older ages. And so we actually did kind of want to see if there's anything going on in midlife um, to make more direct comparisons to the Case and Deaton analysis. Um, so we're looking at all cause mortality as well as some categorizations um, similar to previous papers with despair deaths due to suicide, alcohol, and drug related deaths. Um, and then a metabolic category due to uh, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, or obesity. And just in light of the Cancer Research UK's new ads about how obesity is causing more cancer than, um, <clears throat> than smoking, I just wanted to point out this is probably an underestimate of, of actual deaths that might be due to obesity. And I'll, I'll get right to some of the, the pictures. So this is um, overall mortality for these three different midlife age groups, um, which obviously have different overall levels of mortality. Um, but I think what you can see is um, definitely a leveling off of improvements in, in mortality and, and certainly an indication, especially in England and Wales, of an uptick in mortality in the more recent years for these young age groups. Um, in Canada, it's, it's looking like they might be headed in the same direction, but, but a couple of years behind. Um, but it definitely um, looks like there is a lot going on. You know, there is something going on even in these age groups um, with mortality, overall mortality. And then breaking it down into these two kind of, um, not exactly competing, but these hypotheses about metabolic versus despair deaths. Um, again, these are quite low levels if you're, if you're looking at the absolute levels for the, the youngest age group. Um, but I think it's clear that this, there's you know, been, um, been a stall in improvements in metabolic mortality. These were declining very precipitously and um, we're definitely seeing a leveling off of improvements and potentially um, starting to see increases in, in metabolic mortality at middle ages. Um, and so it was interesting to hear that's, that's been seen in some other contexts with CVD mortality. Um, and for Canada, again, it looks a little um, less obvious that there's um, an increase, but potentially some evidence of this leveling off um, for certain age groups, and, and we'll certainly be interested to see the, the most recent year there. Um, so turning to the despair deaths, which again includes suicide, alcohol, and drug-related deaths, um, you know, you can see that, that there is kind of a slight increase um, over, over time um, in England and Wales. So it's, you know, not nearly as dramatic as what we've seen in the U.S., but some indication of some increases. Um, and again, a slight increased trend in, in Canada as well. Um, but I did want to point out that the order of magnitude, and you could see this um, from the previous speaker as well, um, the order of magnitude of these deaths of despair is, is dramatically larger in the U.S. So um, you can see the, the scale here was getting up to sort of 45 deaths per 100,000. Um, and for the similar age group in the U.S., you can see the increase has gone, you know, all the way up to way over 80. Um, and that little arrow kind of shows where, where the U.K. Um, would be about now. So even though it's very troubling that there's been a you know, relative increase in these rates, um, the absolute magnitude is still much smaller than the US. And then um, kind of decomposing those deaths of despair then into drug um, and the, the components drug-related deaths, um, we do see, as was alluded to um, previously, this increase in, in deaths due to drug, drug overdoses. The opioid epidemic has indeed um, spilled over into Canada a bit. Um, it's you know, not exactly the same, but um, we're seeing um, also in England and Wales these increases in deaths um, due to fentanyl and heroin. Um, again, increasing from you know, lower absolute levels, but still some, some troubling trends over time. 
Um, for suicide mortality, I, you know, it looks to me like there's not a definitive trend. There's a slight increase for, for some of these age groups, um, but it's not a very large um, uptick and, and really no pattern that we see for, for Canada for suicides. Um, and finally, for alcohol-related mortality, um, you can see that, that England and Wales is much higher than Canada, um, but I think over time it's sort of fluctuating um, and not, not a definitive trend as far as that goes. So in some ways that fits with the narrative of, of what's been seen in the U.S., that it might be really ha to do with the opioid <coughs> epidemic, these deaths of despair, and not necessarily reflected in, in trends in suicide and, and alcohol. Um, and then next, I just wanted to, to dig a little deeper. So as I said, the real focus of some analysis by Case and Deaton has been um, whites in the U.S. with the lowest levels of education. They're the group for which um, we're really seeing increases in mortality relative to other groups in the U.S. Um, and as I said, that's been difficult to directly compare um, with the U.K. just from the raw mortality statistics. Um, so you can see this real divergence where, um, you know, those with a college degree are kind of flat, um, although they're, you know, they are moving up a bit. And then those with the lowest levels of education, um, you know, are really increasing mortality. And so I, I thought it was interesting that George presented some interactions for morbidity that looked a little bit more like this. Um, so as I said, we're just starting to kind of want to make a more direct comparison by using the ONS longitudinal study. Um, again, focusing on these midlife age groups um, and sort of restricted to whites only to see what, if those patterns look comparable to what's going on in the US because the um, immigrant population does have lower mortality in, in the UK um, as you would expect. And so these are very preliminary, but um, Again, kind of just doing a dichotomous look at those with no qualifications versus some, we see you know, this dramatic difference, first of all, that we're accustomed to seeing in mortality rates. Um, but at least when I look at this, I don't see you know, this, a similar pattern to what's happening in the US where there's a real divergence for those with the lowest level of education. They kind of you know, look parallel or even converging for a little while, and then they're both, we're starting to see this uptick in mortality for both groups. Um, and we also, you know, looked by occupational social class, and again, you know, more parallel, I'd say, than diverging, but, um, but I think it'd be good to think about the different ways in which we could look at that um, in the UK. So to conclude, I, I would say there's some evidence of a leveling off and possible increase in over overall midlife mortality, um, at least in England and Wales, um, and a slowdown in Canada, which seems to be... Um, coming true for 2017 as well. And we see some evidence of leveling off of declines and improvements due to metabolic um, mortality. And even though we do see an increase in despair deaths, this seems to be really concentrated in drug-related deaths in both um, England and Wales and Canada, um, but the absolute levels remain much lower than the US. Um, and so something I would like to explore more really are these long-term trends um, in the obesity epidemic. Is this something that's finally you know, coming home to roost? The, the US, as you can see from this figure, was, was at the leading edge of this. Um, so it might be um, safe to assume that the US would start to see reversals in life expectancy um, due to the sort of decades of the obesity epidemic um, kind of earlier than other countries. And then the next arrow shows that England is not too far behind and Canada a little bit lower. So sort of seeing a rolling out of these stalling life expectancies if the ep obesity epidemic is playing a role um, might be part of what's going on, but that's you know, a hypothesis to be explored. So, um, and looking at the subgroups, uh, preliminary evidence does not suggest that restricting to whites or low education in the UK shows similar patterns of divergence as the US but I know a lot of people have done um, interesting work on more area level differences that I think um, may tell a different story. And so as I said, I'd be um, very interested to discuss with everyone sort of longer term how we can explore all of the different social and political um, factors <laughs> across countries um, and how this is playing out um, very importantly for population health and mortality. So thank you very much.
what we were looking at was data for, for Scotland only. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, so we were looking at, at Scottish data, and uh, in common with um, many of the, the previous speakers, we've, um, it, it's been clear that there's been a, a, a change in the, um, the rate at which life expectancy has been growing. And for our analysis, we chose the period at the point 2012 to 14 as the break point. This was due to some analysis that, that was carried out by a colleague at NHS Health Scotland who looked at the age standardised mortality rates um, across a, lo a long time period and identified that, um, that the trend began to change between 2012 and 2014. And then just, just to summarise the impact that's having on the Scottish life expectancy figures, so but before the period 2012-14, male life expectancy was growing by 16.3 weeks a year, and then after that point, it fell by 1.1 week per year. And for females, it was growing at a slower rate by, by 10 weeks a year, and then was growing by less than 0 0.1 weeks a year thereafter. So the analysis that, that we've done is um, a decomposition of the life expectancy changes um, before and after the 2012-14 breakpoint to determine how much of the changes um, in growth were accounted for by age and cause of death. Um, I'll not read through the detail of, of, of this slide, but uh, the main points to, to pick out are that we looked at 26 detailed causes of death groupings and for some of the analysis aggregated these into eight higher level groupings. Um, and we presented the results because the two time periods we're looking at um, are different in length, so we presented the results in terms of average annual change to, to account for that. Um, this slide just briefly um, covers the um, different causes of death that we looked at, and the, the main thing to, to note here is that we were keen to look at drug-related deaths um, as a category on its own, but because there are overlaps with other causes of death, um, such as accidents and suicides, for the purposes of our analysis, the accident and suicide data um, excludes any drug-related accidents or suicides. So the first chart, most of this analysis I'm focusing on males, but similar results were, were found for females. Um, this chart looks at the, the, the difference um, between the two periods. So the darker purple bars show the growth in life expectancy for each age group in the early period and the, the lighter bars show the, um, the growth in the later period and the crosses identify the difference between the two. <coughs> and it's quite clear from, from the chart that the crosses are almost entirely in the negative part of the chart, so we have slowdown in growth across almost all age groups, <coughs> but most of it occurring in the sort of 60 to, to 80 age group, that's, that's where it's been having the, the biggest effect. But in most of those cases, life expectancy is still growing for those age groups, but um, at a much slower rate than it previously did. But also of interest, <laughs> in the sort of middle age groups, the sort of 40 to 55 year olds, there's still quite a big um, impact there. And in that case, it's because um, life, exp life expectancy is actually falling in those groups. And then we also see a, a, a slight impact in the, the very oldest with a fall in life expectancy. When we looked at this by cause of death, um, this chart is um, similar to the last one, but we've ranked this um, by cause of death. So the ones on the left-hand side have had the, the biggest slowdown, and ischemic heart disease um, was by far the, had the, the biggest impact. Um, but again, it, it's still growing, it's just not, um, it's not um, contributing as much to life expectancy growth as it did. Um, but of key interest, the, the second category there is the drug-related deaths, um, which also had, had a big impact on the slowdown for Scotland. And in that case, that was going from having a, a very small negative impact to a much larger negative impact. Um, and then other circulatory disease and cerebrovascular disease also having, having a, a, a reasonable impact along with dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, we then try to look at the combination between age group and um, cause of death. And for this, we've um, combined the categories to try and make it a bit easier to follow. Um, so we produce these heat maps to, to identify um, which, which causes of death and age groups were um, contributing to life expectancy. In the, so the, the top of the graph is the, the 
earlier period and the bottom of the graph is the later period. So these kind of purple colours all show where things are, are going well and life expectancy is increasing and the, the red colours are, are where things are um, getting worse. And obviously in the top half of the graph there's quite a lot of purple, um, some quite dark colours, so improvements in circulatory diseases um, and not so many um, red pinky colours, but then when you get down to the, the bottom half you see a lot of the ones that were purple are much um, paler so that the improvements are not quite as big as they were and then um, the concerning um, increases in, in the, the drug related deaths and to some extent dementia. But the, 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 this chart lets us kind of identify the fact that the, what we've seen with the circulatory diseases has mainly been in the sort of uh, 55 to, to 90 age groups, whereas the drug-related drug deaths are in the 35 to, to 54 year old age groups. Um, this just shows the same type of information, but looking, looking at the difference between the two. So again, showing that most of the slowdown has happened in the circulatory diseases in the 55 to 74 year old age groups, um, but um, al also um, a considerable impact from drugs in the slightly younger age groups. But um, one, one slight um, good news out of, of this analysis is that there has been a slight improvement in cancers amongst females um, in that period of time. So in conclusion of the, the, the first part of this, the mortality rates have worsened amongst 35 to 49 year olds and 90 plus year olds, mainly due to drug related deaths in the younger group and dementia, Alzheimer's in the older group. Um, and then mortality in those aged 55 to 84 has continued to improve, but at such a slower rate than before that it's um, pulling back on the life expectancy growth. And in that age group, that's mainly due to the circulatory causes, so the heart disease and stroke and so on. Um, and as I've just mentioned, there was some small positive impact on life expectancy from the cancer mortality among women. So I'm going to quickly move on to Maria, who's carried out some similar analysis, but broken down by deprivation for Scotland. Excellent. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm going to show you some data that is essentially doing the same decomposition analysis, but looking at population, Scotland's population broken down into deprivation quintiles, and for that we're using the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. So, first of all, um, this is, again, the darker bars are the change in life expectancy in weeks per year between 2001 to 3 and 2012 to 14, and the lighter colours are in that later period, post 2012 to 14. First thing to say is that um, life expectancy improvements have got worse in every quintile, so across all deprivation. And sorry, again, this is just males, but it's a very, very similar pattern for females. So it's got worse in all quintiles, but that decrease is much, much more pronounced in quintile one, which is the most deprived areas of Scotland, um, where life expectancy has not just um, stopped increasing as much, it's actually decreasing by 7.7 .7 years. Sorry, 7.7 .7, uh, weeks a year. So we did the same decomposition analysis. Um, so the top graph there is quintile 5, so the least deprived 20% of Scotland. And the bottom graph is quintile 1, the most deprived 20% of Scotland. Um, and this is broken down by age group. Again, the crosses and the zeros are the difference between the first period and the second period. So you can see in quintile 5, the biggest difference is in the sort of middle to older age group from sort of age 65 onwards. And in quintile one, it's at a younger age, so in the sort of 40 to 60 age groups. And in the least deprived areas, while life expectancy increases have decreased, they're still mostly above the bar, um, whereas in quintile one, a lot of them have become negative in that second period. So this graph is now comparing the difference between um, the change between period one and period two in the most deprived and least deprived. So it's highlighting the areas where that real difference between the two, um, between quintile one and quintile five are. So the biggest differences are in that middle aged group. So in age 45 to 49, 50 to 54, um, but all the way up until age 65 to 69, 
and there have been, there's been a bigger decrease in life expectancy improvements in the, least, the most deprived area compared to the least deprived. That only changes around once we get over age 70. And life expectancy in quintile one in Scotland for males is 71 years. So there are not that many people aged above um, 70. Again, this is uh, the decomposition, but this time split by cause of death. Again, quintile five, least deprived at the top. Um, and for both the most and the least deprived quintiles, um, ischemic heart disease is again had the biggest fall in life, um, fall in life expectancy improvements. Um, but when, if you look at the um, quintile one graph, you can see that in second place um, is drug-related deaths, and there's been this huge, they've had a really big effect on decreasing life expectancy. Um, and again, this is comparing the change between period one and period two in the most deprived and least deprived areas. First thing to note is that cerebrovascular disease and ischemic heart disease, while they've both had a really strong negative effect, it's been quite similar in both the most deprived and least deprived areas. And the areas where we've seen the biggest difference between the most and least deprived areas are in drug-related deaths, in suicides, in liver disease, and in um, ill-defined category. Um, the only um, cause of death where we've seen the switch around of this pattern is lung cancer. Um, just to be clear, there are still more people who die of lung cancer in the most deprived areas, but that is improving at a faster rate than it is in the least deprived areas. And again, this is a heat map similar to the one Julia showed before. Um, but the top one is looking at the least deprived area and the bottom one is looking at the most deprived area. And this is the difference between period one and period two. And again, you can see hot spots in circulatory diseases. There's been big decreases there for a slightly younger age in the most deprived area than in the least deprived area. But then there are hot spots in the most deprived area for drugs, for external causes of death that just aren't showing up in the least deprived areas. So to conclude, life expectancy has stalled across Scotland as a whole, but in the least deprived areas, it's still increasing just at a slower rate than before, whereas in the most deprived areas, we're actually seeing a decrease in life expectancy. Um, and mortality is worse than most in younger age groups in the more deprived areas, and it's decreasing in older age groups in the less deprived areas. And when we look at causes of death, it's these um, drug-related deaths and suicides and alcohol-related deaths that are the real big difference between quintile one and quintile five. Just uh, you, the deprivation index you calculated by the area. Yes. Yeah. So, but how small the area is? Um, it's based on, um, I think, there's about six or seven thousand areas in Scotland that that it's split into, and I think there are about seven hundred and fifty population yes. each area. So they're quite they're quite small. Thank all the speakers uh, in this section. Thank you very much to you and to everybody else. That all our elites, you know, are uh, come come on the predominantly from. Um, you know, the upper middle class, the privately educated, the Oxbridge, and so on and so forth. And there have been lots of statistics in the newspapers about the proportion of politicians, senior civil servants, lawyers, etc. And of course, you know, they, these are the groups who have the highest life expectancy and probably feel rather like me, um, getting older and older, that we don't really um, want to <laughs> live too, too long. And I, th I think that may be uh, why, you know, the political class is not particularly interested. Um, whereas, as we've seen, um, and LNG have done a, also a lot of work on this, you know, the inequality uh, is the thing, you know, that really matters. And um, uh, because, I mean, one of the questions that we have as a panel, I think we have 
and the science community is, is there some <coughs> now natural leveling off of biological um, mortality? But of course, when you look at inequality, it, it, it doesn't really make that much sense because you know um, there's a, a huge catch up um, to be done um, by the more deprived, well, not only by the, the most deprived, but all groups under the, the top group. And, and that in itself, getting rid of that inequality, uh, would mean that life expectancy would continue to increase. So I think you know, that's uh, sort of where I'm, I'm coming from. And I hope that uh, the panel now will help further to <laughs> help us understand what is actually going on here. Okay? And I think you're supposed to be talking for between about five and ten minutes. Keep it as brief as you can because we're running uh, very, very late and I've got people coming to dinner. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I will sort of start nudging if you go way over. Uh, so can I call on Ben first to start okay. us off? Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's, um, uh, uh, I'm Ben Barr from the University of Liverpool. Um, I'm a clinical lecturer in public health. So, I mean, clearly, as we've seen, uh, and as Michael Marmot said uh, earlier this week, that if we've got life expectancy going in the wrong direction and inequalities uh, increasing, something is clearly going seriously wrong. And the fact that there isn't greater public outroy outrage and, and the response from government in this is, is really telling. I mean, imagine if it was GDP. You know, it only takes GDP to go in the wrong direction for a couple of quarters and the whole machinery of government is, is moving to address the problem. You don't have people uh, saying, well, first we've got a bit more analysis of this situation before we respond. <coughs> you know, we need this kind of response to, to what is clearly uh, becoming a public health crisis. And it's not as if this has come out of nowhere either. Uh, in, in 2012, we highlighted that uh, suicides were, were increasing following a long-term decline. And at the time, that was dismissed completely by the Department of Health. They said, oh, it's just a blip in the data. It, it took them several years later before they, they recognised that actually suicides were increasing, um, slightly late to do anything about it. And as the programme of austerity kicked in, we have documented how uh, there was a rapid increase in mental health problems and, and a widening of, of inequalities. Uh, and we've shown that that was, was linked to specific welfare reforms. I mean, one policy choice, uh, putting 1.5 million people on disability benefits through the work capability assessment, we've shown that that led to an additional 600 suicides. And again, that evidence was dismissed uh, by the government. And as a result, uh, we're seeing exactly the same mistakes happening again. Uh, We've re recently completed a study showing the marked increase in mental health problems uh, that people are experiencing as they move on to universal credit. So first we saw the effect of these, pol these, these, these policies on, on mental health problems. And uh, we were talking about uh, canaries earlier. Uh, the adverse mental, mental health effects of these policies occur first before people start dying. So now we've seen the, the, these adverse changes in mortality and increasing inequalities, initially with older people uh, and then at younger ages, and now we see infant mortality increasing. And what's particularly striking about the, the, the changes in inequalities in, in mortality uh, is, as we saw from uh, Alexander's presentation, they had been declining uh, in the previous decade, uh, and then we have a reverse of that and with inequalities widening. Uh, if you go back, if you put that data back from before 2001, uh, back into the uh, 80s and 90s, you would just see that they were getting wider in, in absolute terms during the 80s and 90s, and then they narrowed again uh, from 2000 uh, up to around 2012, and then they've been getting wider since then. And we've shown that that, uh, that narrowing of, of the inequalities was due to, to uh, was associated with, it, with an increase in more equitable investment uh, between places across the country. So it's not entirely surprising when you reverse that policy by cutting services most in the poorest communities that you get a reversal uh, of those inequality trends. So in terms of what needs to be done, 
three points, I think, that, that are important. Uh, firstly, is getting the right resources to the people and places that need them. And that's not just about the, the level of, of resources and the level of, of public spending. It's about how those resources are shared out between places. Mm. One, of the, one of the most, or, or one of the few progressive aspects of UK public policy uh, historically has been uh, to allocate a greater share of resources for the NHS and for local government to poorer parts of the country. And that's, that's very different from, from other countries in, in many, essentially most other countries. Local government, for example, in more wealthy areas tends to be funded better because they rely more on local taxes. By 2000, and in, in 2010, uh, the UK was actually the only country in the OECD that actually had more doctors per head of population in the wealthiest region, uh, in, the, in the poorest regions of the country compared to, to the more affluent uh, uh, areas. Uh, every other country in the OECD, it's the other way, it was the other way around. But since then, that equitable distribution of resources has been undermined uh, through a program of, of austerity, through the cuts to local government, which have been far more se severe in the poorest parts of the country, we're now seeing uh, the numbers of GPs per head of population declining and declining most in the poorest, poorest areas. So this previous relationship between need and investment has, has been broken uh, through this uh, program of, of austerity. And what's most worrying is that this, this, this new pattern uh, is becoming locked in to, to policy. The, this post-austerity inequitable distribution of resources is, is now being used to justify reducing the, the share of resources going to those areas uh, as, as public spending increases. So recent, in a recent consultation, uh, the government proposed moving to basically per capita funding for, for core local authority services. So whilst previously poorer parts of the country used to get more funding per capita than, than uh, 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 more affluent areas, uh, the government's now proposing that we, that, that we basically have a level, you know, what they might call a level playing field, so everywhere gets the same amount per head. So secondly, I think we need to, to, to move towards a welfare system that actually promotes welfare. Uh, we know that current welfare reforms have have increased health inequalities and are leading to increases in child and disability poverty. And that's, I mean, the, partly the government's policy on, on welfare is, is to promote employment at any cost. And when people say there's a price worth paying, uh, that, that seems to be one of, one of, the, one of the prices. So we need, to, we need to ensure that in the future, uh, the primary goal of welfare policy is to promote well-being. And thirdly, I think we need to, to give back control in that the UK is uh, an extremely centralised uh, country and inequalities in health are, are fundamentally caused by inequalities in power and influence. So this means strengthening local democracy and transforming pu public organisations so they actually uh, involve the people that they serve in deciding how those resources are used. So. To really tackle this issue, we need to get the resources to the people and places that need them through more equitable distribution of resources for public services, uh, but also through, through the welfare system uh, and give people and places more control over how those resources are used. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, Dominic. Thank you. Um, I want to give a perspective of, as a, a local director of public health and well-being in a small northern town uh, in England and um, really give a perspective that tries to unpack some of what I think is the causality. So Blackburn with Darwin, where I'm based, has um, a life expectancy for males in 2015 to 17 of 76.6 years. The England measure is 79.6. Uh, and for, that's for males. For females, 80.1 um, um, years, whereas England is 83.1. For both male and female life expectancy, it's lower now than it was in 2011-13. So it's lower in 2015-17. Uh, 
So we are one of a number of local authorities who have life expectancy actually going backwards. Um, and m a lot of those, though not all, are in the north of England. They're in post-industrial towns, uh, seaside towns. Some are actually in rural wealthy areas. Um, and uh, I think there are explanations for that, which I want to hint at. Um, we have looked at the data for uh, Blackburn with Darwin because when people, when this first came out, of course, everyone wanted to know, well, what's killing us? What's different? What extra things are you dying of? What new diseases are people getting? And we did look at the patterns of mortality by age and by diagnosis. And we looked uh, from the latest data we had then, which was 15, 17, and we looked back a number of years and found that, firstly, um, people were not dying of anything new. Everyone was dying of the same mm -hmm. things they always died of, by and large. There was a slight rise in drugs-related deaths. Second thing, most of the deaths that had increased, that had caused the increase in mortality, were in older age groups. So over 65, over 75, and over 85. Um, we felt that the, the fact that no one was dying of anything new, but that they were just dying a bit quicker, was telling us something very important. And that was probably that, for some reason, the population itself has become more vulnerable to the things that were always present. Um, and I think this is really critical. We've looked, uh, we looked earlier at um, uh, preventable, amenable and avoidable mortality and I noted that the national rate of avoidable mortality, um, so that's mortality that's both preventable by early intervention and primary prevention or amenable to healthcare system intervention those two things together are avoidable. Um, we are about 30%. So 30% of all our mortality during 2015 to 17 was avoidable. Um, I think this is telling us something quite important as well. Now in terms of causes, um, we've, we're all talking about causes of death. Um, and actually, once we start talking about them, we implicitly use a medical model and actually what, we, what really the causes of death are, as described today, are actually diagnosis at death, mm. which is not the same as the causes of death. Uh, and I would say, for instance, that um, whether you're likely to die if you're ill is not dependent on the level of acuity of your illness. It's dependent on what social support you have. Mm. And I think this is a critical aspect of understanding around what is causing and driving increased mortality. Um, so we know that um, there are some things that the NHS is now unable simply to treat its way out of, that the, the epidemic rise in mental ill health, type 2 diabetes, um, obesity, just putting more money into the NHS for treatment to stop people dying isn't going to fix those kinds of problems. We need to invest more in early intervention and prevention. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn, therefore, from new or emergent concepts uh, of what we count as um, being well or being cured or being recovered. Because often we have a model of you're either well or ill, and if you're ill, you're either cured or not. But actually, increasingly, we have a tidal wave of the population who have one or more long-term conditions um, who are getting into older age and becoming more frail, but are able to be kept resilient and independent and even, in, a, in one sense, recover, as in recover their social function, if they have social assets that support them in their neighbourhoods and communities outside of hospital, outside of clinical care. But one of the things the state has done, especially to poorer communities, has massively withdrawn the very assets that would have enabled communities to be resilient, independent, um, and to recover. You know, because many of the for the cohort, for our population, you know, over 50, 60% have one or more long-term conditions. 
whatever, however good I get as a director of public health at prevention, early intervention, primary prevention, that cohort is already there. My role with them is to help and support them to not become ill enough that they need a hospital or clinical treatment or, uh, or continuous clinical treatment or um, die early. But to do that, I need those assets, those community assets that drive resilience and independence. So it's very significant that ADAS, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, have published, they publish every year their annual report. Um, you can see that on their website um, with their budget statement. And their budget statement says, where are we spending the money? How much money have we got? Where, have we, where is it spent? And this year they reported a £7 billion reduction in adult social care funding since 2010. The consequence of that reduction in spending in adult social care means a bigger proportion of their spend has to go on what is statutorily required, which is if you meet the threshold going into uh, care. Previously they would have spent about 15% of their budgets ideally on prevention, early intervention. Um, and that is the budget that's squeezed because it's not statutorily required by and large and that's for things like Meals on Wheels, day centres, supported travel into places, all those things that are in effect assets, resilience assets of communities. They also comment on the fact that uh, GPs have been reduced and there's a been, and this I think is really significant, a 45% reduction in district nurses since 2010 as well as, and this is a personal um, irritation, uh, well, more than an irritation, um, a 10% reduction in public health spend in local government, brought about by the Conservative government in their 2015 budget statement in November 2015. So all those things together means, you know, we talked about opioid deaths, 10% of the budget for drugs and alcohol services have been withdrawn in this country since 2015. So I think I would say both anecdotally and from the data I have, um, what we are seeing is really a systematic and um, consequential stripping out of prevention, community-based support, early intervention programmes from NHS and local government spend, really through austerity cuts. Um, we've, made vulnerable, we've made vulnerable communities less resilient and less able to recover from ill health events. So our capacity to recover normal social function once we are ill has been undermined by the cuts that government are making to prevention early intervention. Um, this has raised social uh, care system costs, but also um, raised preventable, avoidable um, mortality. Um, so I think we are effectively, systematically exacerbating vulnerability. Um, and the final point I want to make is that, uh, and, and um, Danny Dawling made some reference to it earlier, but if you Google flu season Australia now, you will see that Australia's had a massive rise, uh, one of the biggest, most challenging flu seasons it's had for years. The thing we haven't put much focus on is the ability of the health and care system to manage surge demand, which happens yeah. at times of particularly respiratory illness in the winter. Now what happens then is you get patients in corridors, ambulances turning up late. There's a double whammy because often the hospitals and the ambulance services can have, and GP practices, can have 20% of their own staff up sick, as well as dealing with a you know, massive increase in population level illness. Um, if we get that this winter, the, the system is so stressed and so on the edge and so um, challenged with existing routine illness demands that we are likely to see avoidable mortality arising as, an, as a result of the system's incapacity to manage that surge demand. There's just not enough staff in the system, not enough uh, scope left to cover that. So as well as this undermining of primary assets, recovery assets, resilience assets, 
we are going to see, if we do get a flu epidemic this year, and we are due one, uh, we are going to also see deaths related to inability to manage surge demand in the system. Thank you, Dominic. <laughs> okay, over to you, Ingrid. Thank you. Can I um, have the microphone? Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Ingrid Wolf. I'm a paediatrician and a public health uh, doctor and um, I'm a senior clinical lecturer in child health at King's College London. I'm going to tell you um, just a little bit about why I'm worried about children um, and in the particular context of, of course, of, of restoring life expectancy and with the lens of um, what's happening in the childhood health and uh, death and um, what we might, why, why these problems might be happening and what you might um, do about it. So I've got two kind of halves of my um, working and mostly personal life. I'm interested in, uh, in trying to understand why things are the way they are, um, and that's largely health systems and policy research. It's a very small area for children, um, and it's interesting, um, apropos one of the talks uh, earlier today, because largely I think we have a lot to learn about comparing ourselves with what goes on elsewhere in the world. In other words, if, um, if Sweden could do it, Netherlands can do it, Italy can do it, why can't we do it? Um, and, and how we might um, structure those uh, lessons in a little bit more of a, systemic, um, a systematic way. Um, the other half is about trying to do something about it. And this is where, um, as a clinician and, and, and um, a sort of on the ground um, doctor, uh, I find life rather interesting as an academic. So I'm, I'm running um, a large trial uh, that is about health system strengthening for children in South London. So trying to figure out what can we actually do practically to make life better, health outcomes better, and hopefully save some lives. So let me tell you a little bit about what worries me about uh, children um, in the UK. So as has already been mentioned, I, sh I shan't repeat too much, uh, or hopefully nothing, um, of what's been said before. Infant mortality has now risen three years in a row. That is like the worst canary in a coal mine signal of problems for the health and well-being of our society. Now, the fact that there aren't riots in the streets over that, I find reprehensible. It's an absolutely shocking fact and completely preventable, quite honestly, and, and we tolerate it. It barely makes the news now. Year after year, more infants die in this country than the year before. That's unprecedented. It's not happened in my lifetime. I mean, I'm not that old, but I am getting old. And um, I've never seen that before. So that's really shocking. And what's even more shocking is that it's mostly amongst the poor. So the, the uptake in infant mortality doesn't affect the middle classes and the, and, the, and the wealthy. It's affecting the poor. So that's also shocking and unacceptable. And that tells you something. If you can compare what's happening with the poor and the rich, you know that it's preventable because it's not happening to the rich. So that tells you something really important where there's a solution, but we're not bothering with it. The other interesting thing is what's happening with UK um, child mortality is that it is declining, and you'll see that published every year in ONS statistics and so on. It's getting better, it's declining. Yes, it is, but it's not declining as fast as it should be. It's not declining as fast as it is in, in comparable countries, and that's also a disgrace. There's huge geographic variations that are really shocking and unacceptable, and again, that tells you something. They don't, it doesn't, this is not an immutable problem. This is not a comet falling on us from another planet. You know, if, if for example, the mortality in one to four year olds is twice in the Midlands than it is in, in, in London, well, that tells you something, doesn't it? Um, okay, so, <clears throat> and then similarly, looking at um, the differences between the UK and, and Europe, I was so interested to see some data I'd not seen before in life expectancy, um, comparing ourselves, this was the King's Fund, um, data comparing ourselves with uh, European countries, which is exactly the same when you look, same distribution um, when you look at uh, UK child mortality compared with European. The UK is bottom of the league and has been for a while. Not only is it bottom of the league, it's getting worse, further to the bottom. We are diverting from, um, from the rest of Europe. So <coughs> I'd like to give huge credit, please, to um, Joe Ward, who's sitting at the back, who I have the privilege to be his co-supervisor for his PhD is doing some really exciting and interesting work trying to help us understand what's so different uh, between us and the UK. But every which way we look at it, we're getting, we are worse and we're getting worse. Um, and I'm a little bit tired of continuing to describe um, the problem. 
um, even uh, though Joe's doing a marvellous job about it and, and I'm very excited about it, I disagree with my fellow panellists. I think we, we know quite enough to do something uh, about it now. Yes, not to say we shouldn't do more research, but we, there's plenty of evidence to say exactly what we should be doing and, <coughs> and getting on with it. But just a, an interesting little story about the first time that I discovered, almost by accident, and then tried to publish the difference in um, country-level all-cause mortality in children between the UK and the US, uh, UK, sorry, not the US, U the UK and European countries, they all come down, all the graph lines come down, and um, they look almost asymptotic as they come down. They're pretty close, it all depends on the scale, of course. And when I submitted this paper, this young's really interesting, yeah, I can see that the UK is at the bottom, but it's really close to the other countries. So not very interesting findings. So I changed the scale and I calculated how many actual children the differences in the gaps are. Right? So these are not graphs and rates anymore. These are children and families. And it's a lot. It was a 2,000 per year. If the UK had the same mortality rate as Sweden, that's five a day. So it's a little bit of kind of different ways of looking at the same numbers. But the point is to humanize the findings. I think that's what's really yeah. important. Okay, so um, I'm, I won't talk about avoidable and amenable mortality in children um, because it's been mentioned by the, uh, the talk from the ONS. Suffice to say, it's shocking and unacceptable. It's somewhere between 25 and 30 something percent uh, are the usual figures for children. Lots of different ways of measuring it and, and they're all a bit troublesome. But again, if you take just one particular illness like asthma, and we do a, a, a series of audits on uh, and looking at what happens with children in asthma. By the way, children in asthma die uh, in this country much more, you can't say children die more frequently, more children die of um, asthma in the UK than in, 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 in most other countries. And something like um, two thirds of those deaths have really pretty easy to fix problems that have gone wrong. That's absolutely disgraceful. And yet we tolerate it. Okay. so. Um, Health. I'm going to skip over health because my colleagues have, uh, on the panel have talked quite a lot about different measures of health and the same shocking stuff that you, you would hear uh, as applied to children, you know, rises in the number of children with mental health problems and on child protection plans and so on. I want to tell you just a little bit about the work that I'm doing in South London because it's a population level approach to trying to strengthen health systems and that's an interesting thing to do as an experiment to try and make things better but whilst we're trying to make things better and while we're waiting to measure it, we're, we're learning some really interesting things about the population that um, from a different perspective than is, is usual. So what we do is we, we're trying to improve universal health coverage and early intervention. So we're trying to find all children with a particular condition and try and improve their, their health and prevent them from having problems before they happen. What have we found? For example, with children with asthma, we found that 60% of children who are resident in the population of Lambeth and Southwark, who are not otherwise engaging with health services, i.e. we invite them in, 60% of them have significant clinically important symptoms when we get in touch with them. So these are children who have not presented for care. We've asked them to come in. 60% of them have got troublesome um, symptoms, not well controlled. This is a preventable problem, right? You can't cure asthma, but you can prevent problems from it. 25, and then we ask them about their physical health, their mental health, and their social well-being. 25% of them have got significantly troubling mental health problems. And then we ask about social problems, and I didn't expect um, children and families to, to respond as they do, but they do. 68% of parents in South London are worried about being able to feed their children. 68, in this population, okay, in, the, in, in a very specific population. But nonetheless, so what's so fascinating for me as a, as a doctor is that these are not the only questions I ask patients, but when you ask them very relevant questions to looking after children, what do we find? We find exactly the consequences of austerity. We find that we, parents cannot look after their children with asthma or epilepsy or whatever else it is as well as they should be because they're worried about feeding them. 38% are worried about housing. 12% of parents admit to being significantly worried about their own mental health. So, I think I'm going to run over time, so I will um, stop there. Suffice to say, well, I won't almost, I almost stop there. Um, what I just wanted to talk about is, very briefly, why do I think all this is happening, and what do I think we can do about it? To be really just very brief about it, I think there's a lot of blame shifting and muddled thinking about solutions here. 
I think it's nonsense to say we need to do a whole lot more research before we're going to uh, take some action. I think it's like you know looking at a burning house and saying, oh well, um, maybe all that smoke and, and, and orange light is to do with you know visco or something mm -hmm. like that. It's just silly. We know plenty enough about what to do yeah. about the burning house that is health in the UK, certainly for children. I think this muddle um, thinking between legislation and policy, look at what's happening in health. We had the abominable Health and Social Care Act, which forced um, you know, competition upon people who should be colleagues and collaborators, <laughs> and then now we have to write whole reams of policy to try and get around the legislation. I mean, how silly is that? We have um, a discrepancy between what's happening in, between organizations and people, so we have you know, hospitals um, you know, competing between each other because that's the business model rather than looking after the people, focusing on the people that they serve. We've got a, a, a system that is very focused necessarily, but wrongly, on reaction rather than on prevention because we're so busy firefighting all the time. And then we have this really awful thing which Dominic must feel very acutely, which is, I think, a pretty pernicious blame shifting between central and local government. So mm -hmm. central yeah. government cuts local government off at the knees and then says, well, what, you know, you're failing your local population. So, you know, what could you possibly do? So, um, what do I think we could do for children? I think we absolutely can take action. I think the redistribution of resources, as both Dominic and, and Ben have said, is absolutely paramount. I think we need to start thinking about this problem as if it was an infectious disease or a terrorist outbreak. Um, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't question it if there was a if there's a flu outbreak. You need to treat it. Well, the, probably the wrong um, example, but you know if if, if there was a, an outbreak of you know an infectious disease, you you give a vaccination and you and you prescribe antibodies to the bacteria and so on. We are not doing that. Social protection and economic redistribution is medicine <coughs> for social problems, and we're not treating it in that way. I won't talk about health services and health systems because I'm definitely running out of time. Um, but thank you very much for your patience. Okay, thank you. <laughs> We're all doing very well on time. Gonga, now. That's, that's been for a while now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm Dr. Dan Kowalska, and actually my academic area is witchcraft, and I'm born in Poland. And let me tell you that life expectancy when you get used to being a witch was not even something to talk about. Um, but I'm also director of the Equality Trust, um, set up, as many of you will know, by um, Katie Kidd and Richard Wilkinson. Um, and I'm sorry I haven't been here for the whole conference, but I was at a conference this morning on fair tax, and um, I think you'll see the connections between fair tax and what we're talking about today. So I'm going to just touch on three main areas, and I'm really delighted to see that all of the, um, all of the speakers were touching on areas that I think are really relevant in terms of, of taking policy and evidence to government. Um, but I'm going to talk about campaigning and policy, then beyond statistics, and then really finally collaboration, which I think are areas that, that are really key to getting any shift on this. So um, in terms of campaigning and policy, um, I spend a lot of time hearing news reports um, from academic institutions. I think Cambridge was the latest to say, we're going to set up an institution and get all of the, all of the evidence together um, and then we're going to present it to government. Now, if anybody in this room still believes that if you have evidence of what will work and what the problem is, and you give it to government and they act upon that, then <laughs> you know, I've, probably, I've probably got some bad news for you. Um, and I think that, kind of, that absolutely essential missing link is the campaigning link. It's about the public awareness. We've seen inequality rise up the level of concerns that the public, that the public express. They are concerned about inequality. It's one of the top concerns for the public. Um, and so it's really essential that we're working with academics, we're working with the media, we're working with a range of people, and not just the usual suspects, to talk about inequality. So at the Equality Trust, we work on a range of issues from analysing the FTSE 100 in terms of gender pay gaps, CEO pay gaps, um, and gender bonus gaps. We work um, on mental health, we work with um, young people, to explain structural inequalities to them so that they can go on to campaign on these issues as well. Um, so there's a wide variety of projects that we're running. But the theme of inequality running through all of these projects just really proves to us that it's really, really essential to join those dots. It's essential to join health inequalities um, with violent, um, violent knife crime, with um, low educational attainment, with yeah issues around education and grammar schools and social mobility, all of these issues. 
And I always feel like saying, you know, it's a bit like when um, Clinton was running for president, it was a, it's the economy stupid. I keep finding myself in rooms saying, it's inequality stupid. <laughs> you know, the OECD, the IMF, the World Bank, I mean, they're hardly bastions of, you know, socialism, are they? Are all saying that inequality is the biggest issue. Even if people don't accept the moral issue, and that's not a comment on our politicians at the moment at all, but the economic case is there. And now we've just had research from the World Bank saying that if we want to tackle poverty, it's essential that we tackle inequality. If we bring inequality down, it will tackle poverty. So we have enough evidence. We have enough evidence there. And I think one of the problems is really, um, the elephant in the room, that there isn't the political will. There's a political will, or at least there's a show of political will to tackle poverty. Tackling inequality means not just helping people at the bottom and very nobly helping them up and giving them a step up. It means actually looking at the top, and it means somebody accountable about power. And that's why we're not seeing the political will, despite the most heart-rending evidence that we've heard today, are people actually dying. And there is still no political will to tackle this. Every time we go and meet politicians, we will say to them, we have to have an inequality reduction strategy across government. We can't keep working in silos of departments with programs here, programs there. You know, the latest thing, like, I used to work for an education union, and the teachers would be in despair because every time the government would announce more money for mental health, for bullying, for a range of issues, it was for charities to go in and train teachers so that teachers could tackle it, mm -hmm. as well as actually trying to teach, having some pastoral care, you know, they were looking at the signs of FGM, they were managing prevent, they're now supposed to look at mental health. You know, I do wonder when teachers have the time to actually teach. Um, so, you know, it is really essential that we work in partnership with academics, with the sector, and I'll, I'll go on to talk about problems with the sector as well. Now, this political will also extend, <coughs> many of you will have seen the um, coverage of the visit of the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights in November. Um, we were very lucky to gave evidence to the, to the rapporteur and also he met with about 25 of our young people who were telling him what it was like, the reality of growing up in West London and other areas poor in the UK, or in the fifth most, uh, the fifth richest economy. Um, and last week I was in Geneva um, alongside him when he presented the report and when he presented it to the UK government the following day, the UK government chose not to take a microphone. Now there's been lots of discussion about that report. It's the hard hitting report, and there were comments about the tone of the report, not the content, the tone of the report. But then the DWP um, official doing fact finding, and uh, uh, checking the facts of that report, did admit that everything in that report was factually incorrect. So if that isn't a demonstration of lack of political will, I don't know what is. When we go beyond the stats, and obviously you know, this is a point that Ingrid's referred to, we need to humanize these findings. This is why we set up um, a project called Everyday Inequality, because alongside the statistics, we need to hear the impact of inequality on people's lives. Whether they explicitly refer to it as inequality or whether they just refer to the issues that they're going through is a different matter, but we need to highlight the impact that this is having on people. And also to ask the question, these are socially determinative problems. So who is at the bottom? And we know who's at the bottom. We have a disproportionate number of black, Asian, when we, the EHRC said that the introduction of the universal credit will hit black and Asian women far more, um, far harder, it will hit single mothers. So we know who these problems are hitting. And so sometimes I get a little bit um, annoyed when I hear things like mental health will hit one in four people, you know, there's a chance that you will have poor mental health. There's a disproportionate chance that you will have poor mental health if you're poor, mm -hmm. if you're trying to put yeah. food yeah, yeah, on yeah, the table yeah, for yeah, your yeah. children. Um, so I think it's, it's a little bit disingenuous sometimes to sort of appeal to people on the basis of, well, we're, to use a terrible phrase, all in it together, yeah. when actually we're not. Um, we know, for example, that Gypsy Rider and Traveller populations probably will not live to get their pensions. So there are huge issues within different communities, and these communities know this. They can live with the reality. They don't need the statistics to tell them <coughs> that they're more likely um, not to reach that age. And I think another risk is the debate about measurement. To give you a practical example, um, Jeremy Vine some time ago um, decided that he just heard about inequality and said, oh, this is terrible. 
um, on Twitter, and aside comments about his fees and salary, um, started a debate on inequality. And very soon it degenerated into the measurement. And this is what you'll hear, you'll hear the government saying, inequality's fallen on our watch. But the other thing about that is that inequality has been so high for so long, and this comes back to the issue that um, Dominic, mm. Dominic was saying, that there is a lack of resilience, because a high level of inequality over such a long period depletes the population and continues to. There's a cumulative effect of poverty and inequality for such a long time. I want to come on to talk about collaboration, um, because in my own sector, the third sector, we are still very much working in silos. We're working on issues. And if there's a small disagreement about the theory of change or the, the way we approach an issue, then we go and set up another foundation. Um, and there's a, there's a problem with joining the dots, and I go back to my previous point. That what we're trying to do at the Equality Trust is to bring together a range of organisations, organisations working on the economic side, organisations working in protected characteristics, and race, gender, disability, etc. Um, and a range of organisations to, to start to think about inequality as part of their campaigning, as part of their policy, and recognising that inequality has a place in mental health campaigning. It has a place in youth violence campaigning. It has a place in most of the work that the third sector is doing. So I'd just really like to say as well that we do use um, the longevity science panel stats. I have a slide in one of my standard presentations. And you know, we talk about this in schools. We talk about, we had an equality um, conference at Edale School with six boards a couple of weeks ago. We talk about it with our local groups. We have over 25 local groups in, um, in the UK. The work that you do, if we can translate that from lengthy academic papers into palatable, and I know this does sound awful in a, in a room full of academics, but <laughs> palatable sound bodies yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the key points that people can understand. And with health inequality, people really do get it. I mean, it's really quite obvious, isn't it, what's going on? then we can bring that message to a wider audience. And people, when they find out, are absolutely shocked because they know something's really, really wrong. They don't necessarily have the evidence to articulate what it is they feel is going on in society. So we have some key moments in terms of inequality. Um, in terms of the Sustainable Development Goals, we have a voluntary national review. And although not many people are really talking about Sustainable Development Goals, apart from business, strangely enough, um, this is the government signing up with all of the other governments of the world to a framework that has a sustainable development goal, number 10 of inequality, and signing up to say that they will tackle inequality and they will reduce inequality. So there's a commitment there and there's an accountability. We have the G7 in Biarritz, where Macron has said that the focus will be on inequality. I'm not saying anything about the irony of that. Um, but we also have this, we have to make sure that there is a sense of urgency. This is an issue that is as big as climate change, really. And the links between climate change and inequality are there for all of us to see. So if we don't want to carry on the cumulative effects um, of society on those vulnerable people for, more, for even more decades, and we're seeing the squeezing of the middle class now as well, this is just how deep these cuts go. We need to make sure that we look at the relationships between social care as well. And going back to the work that we do on corporate, which may not seem relevant, I'm going to give two examples here. Um, my cousin was pregnant a couple of years ago, and um, she lives in Chester, and she was about to go into labor. She was going into labor, and Chester Maternity Hospital was shut because there were too many shut to, to read in communication. She called up Wrexham, that was also shut. She ended up having to drive to Liverpool to have her baby. Now, fortunately, her mother's a midwife, and her husband has a car. So, you know, they had the assets to be able to, um, to drive to Liverpool, and everything was fine. But coming back to the point that Ingrid was making, you know, that's, that's an economic privilege. Had she not had those things to fall back on, that the result of that pregnancy could have been very, very different. And at the opposite end of the scale, my mother-in-law was um, diagnosed with dementia, and eventually, because of um, various cuts and because of um, an issue that I think is, is growing more and we don't talk about enough, care homes being cut down, uh, being shut for financial reasons, she was moved three times. By the time she got to the third place, she then entered hospital and within two months she was dead. So 
But these are the stories behind the statistics that really merit far more outrage than we're seeing. And I think one of the reasons is coming back to the policy makers and the point that was made earlier. A lot of the people who are in a position to make policy don't have experience of public services. A critical example was, for example, was universal credit being paid monthly. Because, of course, the people making that policy, of course, we're all paid monthly, aren't we? Why would we not be paid monthly? Had no insight into the reality of the people for whom they were making the policy. And that's something that really has to change if we're going to avoid a lot of these kind of things. Thank you. Okay, so we've had a very, very wide range of. Um, comments and um, insights here. Um, I won't try to sum them up so can, because we've now got quarter of an hour if we stick to the timetable. Uh, who wants to ask a question? Yeah. Who's doing the mic now? Yeah, okay. Okay, do you, do you want to down here? Thank you. Um, I'm Diana Lucia. I'm an independent researcher. Um, one of the things um, that was pointed out was the fact that different groups are affected differentially by austerity primarily. And it's been, it was shown by the women's budget group some time ago that 87% of austerity cuts were borne by women, in particular black and minority ethnic women. And so one group that we haven't mentioned, and my friend and I, Anne and myself, we're both part of um, one of the women's um, state pension group, campaigning groups, and we've yeah. been campaigning yeah. for years now to get some justice around the fact that our state pension ages rose rapidly in 2011. So um, most of us are having to wait an extra six years for our state pensions. I've worked 43 years, for example. I've still got another one and a half years to go till I get my state pension. And um, I've written a paper actually showing that, in fact, that this whole thing was a, re a result of the financial crisis. Um, and it's this, uh, there's been some evidence that this has had a drastic effect on many women particularly those from the lower socioeconomic groups who've suffered um, consequences for their physical and their mental health. Um, and there has, you know, that, that has, there's definitely cured clear evidence about it. And yet despite um, all the evidence, campaigning, um, writing papers, um, lobbying our MPs, we've had street protests, we've had all sorts of things. There's been 13 debates in Parliament it was mentioned in um, Philip Alston's report on, on, on 
uh, poverty. Um, as Wanda said, the government's on a denial about the findings of this report. You just wonder, you know, and I think the women, the waspy women, as we call our group, we're at, at one with the younger generations, and the government keep highlighting this thing about intergenerational conflict, which I think is exacerbating the whole intergenerational thing, when actually older people are often concerned about the younger youngsters not being able to get a foot on the housing ladder or not being able to pay their tuition fees, whatever it is. So, um, you know, it's just a feeling of total frustration with what's going on and the fact that, you know, a lot of the MPs, we write to our MPs regularly about these issues, my MP doesn't even bother replying to my letters anymore. He's just fed up with hearing from me. So you think, what can possibly happen now with inequality getting worse and worse and worse? So if anybody wants a copy of my paper, it's in Women's Studies International Forum. I've got some copies here, here if anybody wants one. So Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Okay. Got one over there. Okay, Mike, can you, would you like to answer that? Thank you, yes. I mean, it's, it's true. I was probably it's a very different thing in Europe, but uh, that's different. Right? Mm. Um, and that is a major issue. I look at it from these 15 sort of Western, Western European countries, which are well, more homogeneous than quite a lot of other um, uh, studies. And in 14 out of those, there was a, a reduction in the rate of improvement in mortality in, you know, and they're not going to help her, and there's good reasons for why they're not even out by that. Um, but most cases it was, was, was less severe than in, in the UK, but, it, but interestingly, most of them actually occurred before, they were both around 2005 rather than 2011 in, in the UK. So it is a generalized phenomenon, and then we're going to look for more generalized, uh, and, and I think that, I gave Stack as an example, and that is a sort of net would you know, be in all countries around the same time. Um, another example would be smoking. I mean, there are different patterns, but never there's some reduction in smoking. That's what I'm saying, take a second in terms of, you know, fewer people smoke, fewer deaths, those deaths are not occurring at a later, later stage. Um, the UK had, a, I mean, again, country that hasn't been told enough, the UK had the highest rates of improvement in mortality in, say, the year 2006, 2011. Uh, you know, and it had a very slow rate in the second half. But over that 10 year period, there was essentially no difference. The, the Netherlands and the UK had identical change in life expectancy. France had not quite one year more over 10 years, i.e. three days per year greater improvement than, than in the UK. So they are better. So most, so it tells that most of this, um, what we can explain is not the, the bit of pre and post 2011 in the UK. It's the difference between the UK and, and Europe. It, that's a very different question. A much more thing to be explained. And as you quite rightly say, you then are left with the bigger question of what you know, is responsible for the much more generalised patterns across. Not they're not across all Europe. Canada is rather different. It's your market, the whole way that we can use. There's other you know, factors that there's no point in trying to compare them. 
but um, the sort of Western European band that obviously I don't say band did, you know, after a lot of similarities <laughs> and on some on more commonly but hugely different, for example, um, responses to austerity and I mean they also worth pointing out what's actually UK also had very rapid rise in health spending in the under the Blair Brown government. Six percent a year the government increases in that under the uh, Cameron Clego coalition that went down to one point one percent a year and under Cameron and May government it's been three percent a year. So that's another factor, same sort of argument, you put a lot of money into the health service, you you, know, you preserve lives, those those debts will incur at later as well. And that those sort of things may account for the the greater differentiation between the UK and Western Europe. But you know, in the end there's not much not really a huge difference uh, between the beginning and the end. You're shifting it within that period. Sorry, just to follow up on that. Uh, so because you don't believe in the life expect period of life expectancy as capturing that you know delay in mortality. So if you look at the curves of death, you know, the distribution of death, every year for the UK, you see uh, the curve shifting to the right. You know, year, year on year, yeah, and suddenly from about 2010, 11, it just stopped shifting. You know, the, the, the curve is static. So there, it is a real phenomenon. Whether it's shifted to, you know, because of uh, saving lives, um, I, I'm still perplexed by it. You know, why has that distribution of death, and not also of life expectancy, that average, but the distribution has just stopped shifting to the right as it has done for decades before that? I mean, but it's it should, we have to quite small, I mean, one of these people sometimes over it is these are very, very small numbers of, you know, right. one or two, one percent a year is sort of, of um, change you're getting. It's actually quite difficult to, to sort of, to pick these things out of the charts. I mean, so, I mean, the, the issue is, there is still improvement, I think, to that, um, you know, uh, you will get the same distribution, you're not pushing, you're not pushing those, those deaths, the difference that occurs is that, what you've seen is that it's some of those deaths which would have occurred earlier are now occurring, you know, um, at a later stage. But there's still big deaths. Oh, you are improving more currently, but you are you won't get a huge change in, in the distribution because it should be in death by death. Can, can we? Death is, is this is all getting very technical. Uh, can we get get some more questions about what we're going to do about it? Uh, yes, that lady back there. You had some questions already. In the middle, yeah. Thank you. Um, hello, um, I'm Amy Neal from Cambridge Village in London. Um, uh, the life expectancy stalling that we see is happening even in the high socioeconomic um, groups, um, particularly the children class. Dominic, do you want to try and answer that? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Where's the, uh, yeah, uh, the mic. Yeah. Um, a very good example is look at the Cumbrian villages. In the 1980s, anybody who was wealthy moved out to Cumbria. Um, and you moved into a village. And you didn't go shopping in your local shop. You went to the local, you know, Windermere or somewhere where there was a nice booth, which is the sort of Waitrose equivalent. And you didn't use the local bus service, you didn't use the local shop. Because all these wealthy people had moved into Cumbria, it, Cumbrian villages, um, younger people with kids moved out, they couldn't afford them. Um, moved that on 30 years, and the wealthy Cumbrian villages, a lot of them, have no post office, no bus, bus service, no primary schools. Adult social care workers can't afford to live there. Um, they become vulnerable and isolated when they lose mobility because they can't drive their cars anymore. Now that is, uh, and that vulnerable that vulnerability and isolation is what's generating the loss of um, resilience and recovery capacity. Now that's probably a, an extreme case, the Cumbrian villages, but versions of that are going on all over suburbia and all all over wealthy. 
uh, areas that have high capital um, wealth um, but low revenue income, you know, where there aren't many young people or families able to afford uh, a living wage and to live in those places. I think that's going. That I think that's what's going on in many wealthy places where we're seeing life expectancy going backwards. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I would have said uh, something similar. I think you know the uh, the fact is it's not just the bottom, you know, that's suffering. You know, it's that everyone all the w all the way up and these cuts to public services because we are so dependent on them. I mean, we have a national health service, an education system. Social security—they impact on everybody in different, in in a, in a to an extent. Yeah. Here, just can you pass the mic along? Number one, can we not stereotype um, carers, both in the Southern European countries and in, in um, Britain? There are seven million family carers in this country, and countries like Spain have political and economic reasons for having grand in the house, and are indeed great families with care homes for exactly the same reason that Britain is. Um, and number two, uh, everything you've just said about Cumbria. Uh, I live in Devon, uh, and I've just spent the last five years tracking my career to go caring to a community parent. Um, we have exactly the same problem. We have the highest number of elderly people, I swear, football in Italy or whatever, uh, of any county in, in this size. Um, so I'm really, really, really interested in the politics of this, and just purely Thank you very much. Um, can we have uh, one more? Yeah? Um, can I have the lady behind you? Sorry, because you have had several goes today. Vina, it's for Vina. Yeah. Thank you. Very, very quickly, please. Yeah. I mean, see, we bother up with Germany to give yeah, examples. I mean, that's um, and, you know, which people somehow don't, you know, 
uh, emphasise same way again, so I think when you're, I mean, some of you are, I mean, got a better on many in terms of job entry, better than the UK, uh, green people, women in particular, are quite much better. Smoking, uh, although it can be quite high now, was no 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 in the past in some, some, some countries, for example. So they are going in with a, you know, a life course, a much better life course in many ways. They can now see uh, education, they actually die a level of education in the past in, in some of the you know, under fascism or the rest of it. Um, that's uh, that tends to change, but you know, on many of the cases, they're, you know, they're, they're a better bet for the longevity than, than British women, for example. So, um, I mean, we've done better than because we've been richer. Um, uh, that's been eroded, even that kind of is being eroded to, to, uh, to a certain degree. So, I don't think it's surprising that, you know, um, we're actually not doing as well. You saw the obesity figures, for example, would be one example. Or, you know, there's Britain pretty close to the US, whereas, you know, um, you know the southern European countries are probably going down. And the beauty, at the moment, it's not a major issue. It's a slow burn, but it is, it's time to actually come through. And, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're not as good, you know, um, at health in the domestic lifestyle as we, as we ought to be compared to those countries in particular. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to draw this to a close because we are uh, running a bit late now, but thank you very much for uh, all your comments and questions, and I'm sorry to the people who have their hands up that we don't really have time for. I mean, the, I think the, the, the final session here has been really interesting, pulling things together, and I think there's several messages that have, have come out of it. Can you hear me? You, um, yeah? Uh, the first is this whole question about direct action and what can those of us who sort of understand the, the situation um, quite well, what can we actually do about it? And I think, you know, that's a very, very frustrating thing, uh, you know, for many of us, um, you know, who tried and never get anywhere and so on. So that's, you know, what can we do about it? The other thing is, I think the whole question of what to do about it, I think, you know, Ingrid has summed it up and lots and lots of uh, our talks and discussions, particularly on the panel, we do know, you know, what to do about it, um, but you know, we somehow have got to mobilise the resources and the political will um, to do it, which links to the direct action. And then I think my final comment would be: I think there's been a strong message um, to those of you who are researchers and statisticians, you know, to keep doing the work, but to make the messages and the graphs and all your tables, you know, simple, so that the people who um, you know, like Vanda, who use them, you know, can use them to much better effect journalists as well, actually, very importantly. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to all the people who've contributed, because I think it's been a really, really useful um, and very, very insightful afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>